vote for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio. For the Masses. Yeah. How you doing? Today's Wednesday, April 15th, 2020. One hundred and six days into the new year, just two hundred and seventy days left. We are live from a bunker. A bunker that is somewhere in the middle of beautiful downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world. All across the United States. Hither and tither. To and fro. Back and forth. Up and down. East and west. North and south. Far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking? How you doing? How you doing? Now, tonight's the night. (laughs) What a great week, right? Great week, Adam Apollo, Uri Geller, tonight, Randall Carlson, the Beard of Knowledge. Oh, man, I cannot wait for this. Randall, if we go back, if you know, we turn back time a little bit. Let's go back four or five years. And, and Randall's absolute uh, explosion into the world of knowledge is it's been so much fun to watch and he's such a talented guy and for him to be a part of this show is it just means a lot and and speaking to him today you know yeah you know it's just speaking to him this week but uh speaking to him today man he is so excited to be here and to hang out with all of you and there's nothing cooler to hear uh, Randall Carlson say, man, I can't wait to be on tonight with you and the fader knots. <laughs> it's just like, man, that's what I'm talking about. Randall Carlson is here tonight. And where we are going tonight, now we've done so many different shows with Randall. We've done, uh, we did a presentation, a virtual seminar on uh, geometry and sacred geometry. We've uh, gone back and and talked about uh, different periods of civilization and life on this planet and changes. Done that a couple of different times with different focuses on on different timelines. And uh, we've done uh, huge conversations on Egypt and megalithic structures where we've spent, spent an entire show on that. Tonight... We're going in a completely different direction. Yeah, that's all right. And, you know, and this is what's great. I'm just going to let everybody know, okay? Just listen to me. Randall and I just have a conversation. That's it. I picked out one word. And he said, Jimmy, that's perfect. I, that's that's all I need. I need that one word, right? And that's it 
that's it. We're going for tonight, and and I'm very excited. So stay right there. Bottom of the hour, Randall Carlson. Tomorrow night, right here on this program, Thursday, Fader Night. Open lines all night long. Man, uh, I'm looking at... uh, I'm looking at Twitter, and Mark Dunbar just posted a video. It's a GIF, and it looks like, is that is that Kenny G on a subway? <laughs> that looks like, everybody go take a look at this. Is that Kenny G? <laughs> <If it's, laughs> I would just say, is that Kenny G? <laughs> Go check that out. Follow me on Twitter, right? JTurch Radio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. Everybody is is right there in the sandbox. They can see that video. It's posted right there. And just check that out. In between Spock and the dude uh, lifting weights, (laughs) lifting the books. Is that Kenny G? Oh, man. All right. I just forgot everything that I was doing tonight. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. Hashtag F2BQ is fade to black questions. Any questions for myself or Randall Carlson, post it right there. Okay? Okay. You can also email throughout the show, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. We have two chat rooms open, one over at Spreaker, one over at KGRA The Planet. Hung out with everybody last night on YouTube. You guys are fantastic. Loved hanging out on YouTube, man. I've got to figure out a way to do that more often. The thing is, just like um, just like Twitter with the sandbox, you've got to stay focused. You have to read everything. And I uh, there's no way that I could do the show and have that up in front of me. And uh, with Twitter, at least, I've got it sorted out a bit where I've got F2BQ sitting over there, and that takes my attention when it clicks because that's just fade to black questions. All right, let me get a few things out of the way. Keep your immune system in check. Right now, go and visit GetTheT.com. Use the promo code FADER, F-A-D-E-R, because you are a FADER. And you will get free shipping on orders over $50. The, the banners, the, lo, uh, the links, everything that you need is over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. And also, I want you to go and check out Billy Carson's new internet TV network for BiddenKnowledge.tv. You get a three-day trial for free. So go and check it out right now for BiddenKnowledge.tv. The banners are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. And also, when you're over at JimmyChurchRadio.com, the banners are right there for River Moon Coffee and their new Amazon store. That's right. Featuring Fade to Black Blend and our new blend, Game Changer. Yeah. Head right over and check out the Amazon store. Promo code is Jimmy RMC. All caps. Jimmy RMC. That's Jimmy River Moon Coffee, in case you haven't figured that out. I want to know, is that Kenny G? I had to pull up my 45. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, You know, I've heard all of these rumors uh, over the years that Kenny G is like uh, uh, the majority stockholder in Starbucks. And it's weird. You can find chatter about that on the internet. I think Kenny kind of downplays it, but I think I think Kenny, <laughs> I think Kenny's rolling right now. He's not worried about that uh, soprano saxophone or whatever you call that thing. All right, let's get to the breaking news: a newly discovered asteroid named 2020 GH2, which is about the size of your house is going to pass by Earth tonight. And it's not only going to pass by Earth, it's going to be in between the orbit of the moon and our planet. That's right. Not on the outside, in between the Earth and the moon. The asteroid is going to pass Earth at a range of about 223,000 miles. Now, that may sound far. To me, that is close And in the world of the universe, in our galactic neighborhood, in our solar system, 223,000 miles is about that far. It's pretty close. The moon is 239,000 miles away, so it's going to miss the moon 
by about 15,000 miles. And just think about it. 15,000 miles an hour, 20,000 miles an hour. You do the math. It's close. It is close. They're saying don't worry. But you can watch it. It's pretty cool. Astronomers have uncovered a potentially habitable Earth-sized exoplanet 300 light years away from us. Now, out of the 2,681 confirmed exoplanets spotted by NASA's Kepler Space Telescope between 2009 and 2018 when it was retired, this one is the most similar in size and potentially the same temperature to our planet. Now, the planet has been dubbed Kepler 1649c. It's 1.06 times larger than Earth, so it's about the same size. Receives about 75% the amount of light that Earth gets from our sun. And this suggests that the surface temperature of this exoplanet could be the same as us. Now... The researchers don't know much about the planet or its atmosphere, which could shift the temperature estimate just a bit. But I say maybe they should contact the brown dwarf wind dudes that I reported on last week. I'm just saying answers could be right there. The Star Wars UFO Artificial Intelligence Conference in Laughlin, Nevada, slated for... November 5th through the 8th is still on. That's right. Just go to StarWorksUSA.com for tickets and info. I'm going to be there. Rita's going to be there. Our entire Fade to Black crew is going to be there. That's right. The Aquarius Hotel and Casino right there in Laughlin, Nevada. Just visit StarWorksUSA.com. The banners and links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. And uh, the Disclosure Fest event at the historic Los Angeles Park in downtown Los Angeles, scheduled for June 20th, is still on. And the state of California and the city of Los Angeles, up until today, say it is still going on. And then we had uh, the mayor and, and the governor today say some weird things about no concerts or athletic events until 2021. No more crowds. Ah, well, we're expecting 20,000 on June 20th. And that announcement came today. But they're still saying that Disclosure Fest is on. So visit DisclosureFest.org, and we will make announcements not only here on this program, on our live stream, and over at DisclosureFest.org. All right, let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today, Seth Rogen is 38. Now, Seth, to me, why do I got to make a comment after a guy like Seth Rogen? Well, it's because there are times when Seth is really funny. Like, I think he's the funniest guy on the planet. And then other times, not so much. You know what I mean? But he's been in some good stuff. So there you go. He made the list. Seth Rogen today is 38. One of the greats on this planet right now, Emma Thompson, today 61 years old. And today, guitarist Dave Edmonds is 76 years old. That's right. I always think, when I think of uh, Dave Edmonds, I always think of Nick Lowe. Like, those two just, you, you know what I mean? And if you've never heard of one, you probably never heard of the other. What was that name of that? They had a band called... Uh, I had the uh, the first album. Maybe they only did one. Rock Pile. Rock Pile. Senior year in high school. On this day in history. Are you, oh, wait. Our dead guy's birthday today. Leonardo da Vinci. 1452 to 1519. Died at the age of 67. Of course, the Renaissance artist. The inventor. The polymath musician and architect who painted the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper, and drew the iconic Vitruvian Man. He also devised such futuristic technology like tanks, solar power, that's right, adding machines, that's right, anatomy, civil engineering, optics, and hydrodynamics. Happy birthday, Leonardo da Vinci. Without you, there would be no Dan Brown. 
I'm just saying. On this day in history, 1912, king of the world. The British Ocean liner Titanic sinks into the North Atlantic, about 400 miles south of Newfoundland, Canada. Fader fact. Bet you didn't know this. There is a gargoyle, a Darth Vader gargoyle, on the Washington Cathedral. That's right. And it's real. It is there. It was placed there after a children's design, a carving competition that was held back in the 1980s. And you got to check out the picture of it. It's pretty cool. Tonight, the Beard of Knowledge, Randall Carlson, joins us. Tomorrow night is another Fader Night, and we'll be giving away more Fade to Black memberships. Four. I'll give away six. Doesn't matter. Tomorrow night, live. Open lines all night long. Give away some more Fade to Black memberships uh, to those in need and who are staying at home. All right, let me hit this River Moon coffee. Fade to black blend. I don't have the... We we drank all of the Game Changer. Yeah, so this is Fade to Black blend. And uh, soon, the next time when I'm drinking Game Changer, we'll see the effect that it has with me live on the air because this makes me go... <sighs> Man, that's good coffee. My daughter's texting me. I got things to say. I I, I got stuff to do. Uh, oh, isn't that cool? Re, Nicole wants to come by tomorrow. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know. Let's do it live on the air. Love you, baby. All right. Uh, I think that it's time we talk entropy. Again. For most of you, You've uh, heard me discuss this enough to understand and have a, a basic view of my take on it, what entropy is. But let's start once again with the actual definitions. In physics, entropy is a thermodynamic quantity representing the unavailability of a system's thermal energy for conversion into mechanical work, often interpreted as the degree of disorder or randomness in the system. The real-world definition of entropy is as follows. The lack of order or predictability, gradual decline into disorder. Okay? You got that? You got that right here on the frontal lobes? I have brought up entropy and how it may apply to different parts of our society today. I have done this many times. I've written about it. I've spoken about it. I've interviewed about it. And some of the elements of society today that I've covered over the years is things like the computer systems of Wall Street. Those computer systems in Wall Street all started out simple. At one point, it was just like one computer, right? Very simple. But today are so complex, nobody understands what's going on. There isn't anybody that is the head of any organization. That's right. Wall Street is headed for real disorder. And we see it happen every single day when those computers buy stock instead of humans. And all those stock trends go down in nanoseconds because computers are making those decisions. And then we have our communication systems. Uh, the communication systems on like in satellites and on the ground, right? Communication systems for cell phones, for news, for entertainment, for smart anything. It all started out simple, right? And today are far too advanced, again, for anyone to really understand truly headed for real entropy. Then we have the Internet. And again, the Internet started out simple, right? Uh, Air Force Academy to Stanford, right? <laughs> one line, one little email, hey, man, what's up? Right? Right? Think about that for a second. 
And today, the internet has grown into the most complex and connected system that has everything, literally everything, every person, every business, infrastructure, transportation, logistics, military, education, healthcare, every single aspect of every life, of everything in every country on this planet. This is entropy happening in its purest form. Start out simple, you get complex, disorder comes unglued. Now, let's just take a step back for a second, all right? I want you to hear me out. The worldwide crisis that I have declined to talk about over the last couple of weeks, but you know what I'm referring to, that worldwide crisis that we find ourselves in may have stopped entropy in its tracks. It has forced everyone on this planet, every country, to slow down and to take the time to reflect. To reflect on the way that we have been doing things. Now, sometimes you just need a shock to the system. Something real, something tangible for everyone to just go, well, all right, it's time to change. Now, I'm going to mention something right now that may seem a little harsh, but it's true. Okay? Japan. Before the end of World War II, Japan was completely out of control. And it goes back a thousand years. That's right. They were completely out of control, invading everything. That little island had a very bad attitude. The world's image of Japan wasn't a good one. No, in fact, most countries were very, very scared. They were. Japan was intimidating. Today, our image of Japan is completely different. It's because the entropy was stopped. By the end of World War II, Japan had a complete lack of order and predictability. They did, and they declined into complete disorder. I'm talking about before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All right? Things happened after that. We know. And when they did... They made those changes. Japan was forced into making re all of which started off simple. Expanded as far as they could take things, and then entropy took over. And as funny as this may sound, this is the micro. This is the micro version of entropy, not the macro version of what entropy can do. This time around, we are seeing it at a global scale, the macro side of things. It's called our Earth, all of it. But this time around, we didn't make these changes that are happening today because we wanted to or that we saw that it was needed to make these changes. You know, the changes I'm talking about, too much pollution, too much war, too much anger, too much negativity, right? No, we are forced into a new worldview because it was something that we couldn't control. Entropy. So the world was forced to stop for a few months, which includes the wars, the crime, the negativity, the pollution, and maybe if we're really lucky, entropy. This gives us a chance to reset and figure out a new path forward. It can be done. The old ways of doing things just didn't work. For now, we have what we need. I need you to think about this. Because we do have the internet. We do have great technology. We have amazing health care. We've got great transportation. We have an education system in place. And the arts. You know, we have everything here. It's ready to go. So, let's just focus on the future. If I were president, if I was president, I would go on national TV today. Today. 
I would go on national TV, and then I would visit every region of the world, and I would just say, stop. Did you hear that, Rita? It's from a TV show we're watching right now. Stop. Everyone just stop. We've all had enough. That would be my message. One word. Stop. In the past, this would have been impossible. In fact, it would have been impossible just two months ago. Today, well, I think everyone has had enough. The shock to the system has actually happened. A shock so violent that nobody could have predicted it. But it has happened. The emotional impact on everyone will... It's, it's going to be around for a very, very long time. The laws of physics and the one thing at its core is entropy. And this time it has a chance to be beaten for the first time in all of history. There is a side effect, though. That's right. Of course, hopefully, E.T. is watching. And we'll show the universe that we're ready and willing to grow up. I'm just saying. And remember, for any advanced civilization to find us here, they would have to have kicked Entropy's butt a few times. Seriously. That's right. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, the beard of knowledge, Randall Carlson. Looking forward to this. He'll be with us right after this short break. You can follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. You can follow Randall at SacredGeoInt for Sacred Geometry International. That's the Twitter account. I don't make this stuff up. Ah, uh, there he is. Stop! Stop! <laughs> I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. This is Fade to Black. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. OMG! People are jumping on board to the Life Change Tea Regiment. Brew, steep, and drink. For a gentle, taste great cleanse, it's changing how they feel. See what everybody's talking about. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea aids in digestive slowdown and helps people get moving down a healthy path. We won't make claims. We'll just let you decide. Experience is much better than a commercial anyway. If you want results, log on to GetTheTea.com and purchase your super strength cleansing tea. You won't be disappointed. And if you're looking for some mind-body suggestions, go to YouTube and punch in the search bar, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. Put power into your health now. 
So, get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com for super strength tea. And YouTube, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now for valuable suggestions. Get the tea.com. The tea that makes you go. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA. The planet. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Mass is Kyle Matthews, Matthews, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Randall Carlson is here. Get ready for that. Tomorrow night is another Fader night with open lines all night long. Tonight, it is Randall. We're going to be talking about... Oh, just wait. We've got one word for you tonight. Randall. Randall is a master builder. He's an architectural designer, teacher, geometrician, geomythologist, geological explorer and renegade scholar. He has four decades of study, research, and exploration into the interface between ancient mysteries and modern science. We're going to be discussing all of that tonight. He's been an active Freemason for over 30 years. He's a past master of one of the oldest and largest Masonic lodges in Georgia. He has been recognized by the National Science Teachers Association for his commitment to science and education for young people. His work incorporates Ancient mythology, astronomy, earth science, paleontology, symbolism, sacred geometry, and architecture, geomancy, and other arcane and scientific traditions. For over 25 years, he has presented classes, lectures, and multimedia programs synthesizing this information for students of the mysteries like myself. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the beard of knowledge, Randall Carlson. Randall, good evening, man. Well, thanks for having me again, Jimmy. Hey, you know, the beard of knowledge, you can't escape it now. You know that, right? Do you wear it with pride? <clears throat> well, I've always worn my beard with pride, only because I have no other choice. Um, <laughs> I'm one of those, I've got such a, you know, I've got such a sensitive face, uh, Jimmy, that, uh, I, you know, when I shave it, and that harsh metal goes against my skin. Right. It always leaves a brash. So. Well, you know, you're you're supposed to be the rugged outdoorsman. You can't say that publicly. Well, you know, I've managed to have a lot of people fooled for many decades that I'm this rugged outdoorsman type. Right. Just because I grew up in the outdoors and spent a lot of time in the outdoors. But these days, I'm just hanging around the house doing normal things, you know, kind of like normal people do finding out what that's all about, and I'm actually finding it rather satisfying in a low-key kind of a way. Uh, Randall, if you and I, if I was lost in the woods, you would be the guy that I would uh, want to get lost with. You could build a house You could build a house with a pocket knife. We could have shelter nearly immediately, and uh, we, we could probably just build a whole farm. Well, we could try. You know, I'm not quite as adept as I once was. Um, you know, there was a time when I was young and spry, and I could pretty much, I could climb a tree and, you know, dig a hole six feet deep and do all, you know, dig a well, do all kinds of stuff. Now I'm a little bit slower, you know. I've had a few things that happen over the years, you know, a few accidents. That's the kind of work that I do, and so... Now I turn over a lot of that to the younger guy. Yeah, you know? Rand, Rand, let me ask you a question. I'm going to yeah. ask you the question you've never been asked right now. How okay. many times do you get a phone call from somebody that wants to build a back deck and if you would come over and help? You're the guy. That's who they call first. Yeah, well, you know, I built probably a couple of hundred backyard deck over the years um seriously right um right right i guess i haven't built one for a couple of years i think summer before last i built a multi-story deck um it was um pretty pretty good little project but for the last four or five months i've been building a restaurant and it's uh just about finished 
um, the timing is rather interesting because our uh, date to be open, which is going to depend on inspections, fire marshals, and all of that, and then we have to get a certificate of occupancy. But we're looking to open in three to four weeks, so we're hoping that the country will be open again and people will be ready to get out and and um, eat some good food and that sort of thing. So this restaurant is going to be, uh, it's called the Wheelhouse, the Wheelhouse Craft Pub and Kitchen. You know, we'll have craft beers and a lot of good farm-to-table kind of menu real wholesome menu so uh yeah it was a it was a randall carlson design um this is uh, how we landed the job oh uh, are you building it for somebody else or is this your restaurant or you're a partner well, in it i as part of the agreement um my brother and i was my partner in the business as we're getting a, a percentage of the ownership so that was kind of what we negotiated right from the beginning so we actually, what we're doing is we go in with our team and do the build-out, mm-hmm. um, but we were originally going to be a subcontractor, and the general contractor fell through, so at the last minute, we kind of stepped in to fill his shoes, and we agreed that, well, for the project management, we'll take a piece of the action. So right that's on, man. How, how it, right yeah. on. So do you get to, yeah. are, 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 are you going to be one of those hands-on owner, partner guys that you get to do uh, the menu selection, it, the taste testing, you get to check out the menu? Are you going to be like that? I'll get, yeah, I'll get to do some of that. And in fact, the, the owner has agreed to name a grilled cheese sandwich after me. So, um, you know, that itself is going to be worth a lot. <laughs> because I do, Jimmy, make a hell of a green, uh, grilled cheese sandwich. I bet you do. I bet you do. That is fantastic, man. Hey, I've got good coffee for you if you want a, a good house blend. It's uh, it's called Fade to Black. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would like to try that, yeah. actually. I, I've not tried your coffee. Here, we've been talking for years, and I haven't who tried your coffee you know there's no excuse for that is there and uh thank you for thank you for throwing me under the bus we will (laughs) we'll send you some out right away i am no i'm seriously i i'm a uh, a connoisseur of good coffee and i would love to drink some fade to black coffee i know that there's been a deficiency in my life recently and i didn't really know what it was i think i've got it figured out now yep okay we're gonna get it to you yeah it, you have All to be right. ready. It's the best, you know, so you have to be prepared for that. It's a shock to the system that something this good could actually have been out there and you didn't know about it. So we'll take care of that. I know. We'll, we'll, we'll hook you up. Um, uh, this is, uh, I, I kind of want to change gears, but I don't want to do it too rapidly because this is such a heavy subject that we are going to be discussing tonight. But the first thing uh, I did want to ask you, we we've been, have not talked about uh, coronavirus on the show for a couple of weeks. I have uh, I made a conscious decision to do that. But I do want to ask, how are you guys doing out there? How's the family? How's the town? How's the city? Is is everything okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, you know, it, it's giving me a taste of what normal life is like for normal people. So, you know, staying at home and, you know, hanging around the, the house in my slippers and that kind of thing. Right. So we're, we're, we're doing okay. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I've been staying busy. My wife has a pretty uh, critical job at Emory University. She's uh, in facilities management, and part of her job is keeping critical infrastructure running. So she's had her hands full. We, we've, you know, we've been working and I've been noticing the last few days there, you know, I, I'm, I'm having to get out and, you know, actually my perfect particular job is listed under essential services here in Georgia. So, um, you know, I'm out doing my stuff and, you know, if people got to have something, you know, if there's a storm and a branch falls on people's roof, I, I can send a team out and, and, and get them fixed up, that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, you know, I've noticed the last couple of days, uh, this week, each day the traffic has gotten a little bit heavier. For a couple of weeks, I was going, hey, this is kind of nice. This is like normally what you'd be driving around on 6 a.m. Sunday morning. That's right. You know, but, uh, yeah, you know, when I leave my street, uh, I have to turn left onto a fairly busy, you know, I'm on a residential street, I turn left on a fairly busy uh, road, and I usually just about always have to wait, you know, waiting for my hole to come along. For a couple of weeks, no waiting. I come up there, 
boom, there's nobody there, it's wide open, I go. This morning, I had to wait. So that's telling me that people are getting back out, and I think it has to do with the fact that as the numbers are coming out, we're realizing that, you know, when you look at the, the, number, the percentage of deaths, for example, and realize that the, <clears throat> the statistics are, are going to be skewed because they're looking at hospital cases, and in most most of those cases, it's people who are already hospitalized with life critical conditions. So you're not looking at the population as a whole. Any statistician can tell you that if you narrow down your your uh, database too much, you're, you, it's very likely you're going to get a bias in there. And that's kind of what's happened. I think that there's probably going to turn out to be millions of people that are walking around that have already had it, including me and mm-hmm. my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been work there's a, a videographer retired from CNN who's been documenting this building this restaurant that we're doing mm-hmm. so he's there every day with his cameras and he's documenting it well in January he got real sick and this was before the it went to the ho- went to the doctor they diagnosed it as pneumonia and it, it just based upon you know vis- visual symptoms but he had all the symptoms he had he had the dry cough the headaches the fever he was sick for two weeks, then got better for a week, then got sick for another week, then he got better. Right after that, which takes us like to the end of January and early February, I got sick for a couple of weeks. Same damn uh, symptoms. Right. I had the dry cough. I had a four deg- I had, Normally, I had 101 temperature for three or four days. I had a headache. I felt fatigued and achy. I got over it. Went, went oh, four or five days felt pretty good and then it relapsed however the relapse was much shorter and much milder than the first almost like the the viral load had had gone down but there was just enough that it kind of kicked back in again which is very typical of the coronavirus from what i've been able to ascertain my wife then got it of course now we got better and i've been feeling great ever since um you know, we were out today for our fitness walk, and I was just churning up these hills, and my wife says, slow down, slow down, what's going on? You must feel good. And I said, I do. I feel <laughs> right, great. Right, right. So, uh, and now I've been talking to people about this very thing, and I'm hearing reports, I'm reading reports that this seems to be pretty common. People have, have been a lot of people who got ill to varying degrees in, in January and February, they got better. What that means, I think, is we're farther ahead on the uh, herd immunity curve than, than we thought we were. We, so, uh, we did a conference uh, back in February, uh, oh. the beginning of February, right as things started to hit the news, right? right? And uh, it was at, a, uh, at the Hilton Hotel in, at LAX, of all places. And so at the Hilton, mm-hmm. we've got you know, 15,000 attendees at this conference. And uh, it was something that we were thinking about a little bit. Uh, We try to stay in front of the news, but the flight crews are coming in and staying the night at the hotel uh, for different airlines. And certainly for, for China, for Taiwan, Singapore, and they're all coming in with their face mask. And and you know me, Randall, I, I can't help but talk to people. And I'm going up and, sure. and asking them how they're doing it. But looking back, okay, so after the conference is over, a whole slew of our friends got sick with the flu. Nobody thought about coronavirus. But I had friends saying, this is the sickest I've ever been in my life, right? And uh, I didn't get sick. Rita didn't get sick. A bunch of us didn't. But we were asking for trouble. I mean, think about that. We went literally went to ground zero. LAX Hilton, flight crews from China, right? <laughs> Staying at the hotel. Yeah. And, uh, well, and you know, yeah, Atlanta here is, uh, you know, international hub. So for months, people flying in and out from all over, including China. So it wouldn't be too shocking to imagine that, you know, it, it actually showed up here, you know, late last year. Um, I, I went what, up. You know, the, the, I went up yeah, to. The problem was. Oh yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, well, <clears throat> okay. You you were first. I interrupted. <clears throat> well, I was just going to say that I think that the problem was is that there were people who were onto this early on. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we should have been doing testing right immediately, which didn't happen. Um, 
And, you know, when we're go, going back now to early February, we, we, we lost about six weeks as far as testing because if we had tested, we'd have kind of known where the hot spots were and we would have known that people actually had it that were asymptomatic. But, and this is, of course, testing, um, what happened was you had several hundred uh, independent testing labs with uh, testing kits ready to go out, and the FDA clamped it down, didn't let them. Well, what they did was they said, well, you can do it, but you've got to go jump through all of our bureaucratic hoops first. You've got to fill out all this paperwork, and then you have to send the tests to us so that we can also test your tests. But what was, you know, the downside there is, you know, when you to do these tests, you have to have these reagents, and they're very short supply. So what they were proposing to do then is, well, we're going to take your tests and we're going to test them, but that might take two to four weeks to do. And in the process, we're also going to be using up critical supplies that are going to be needed to get these tests out there, you know, amongst the population. So really, I mean, what happened was right off the bat, the government botched it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think uh, we're going to look back, and that's uh, the analysis that we are going to have with this. And the other mm. thing that yeah. makes things really complicated, um, I'm an American. I love this country. So are you. Of and course. one of the freedoms yep. that we have here is vacation, right? We can jump in the car, drive, mm -hmm. fly, do anything we want. At it, That's it. It's a basic fundamental right here. And it's difficult for state governments or for the federal government to go and impose those types of restrictions on Americans that that is the one. If there is a fabric that holds us all together, it's it's getting in your car and driving, right? That, that's what we do, yeah. right? And so yeah. that's, that's the other thing that makes it really difficult. Now, staying on the subject, but moving into what we're going to talk about tonight, the, the coronavirus uh, crisis, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, has caused the planet to go on hold. The hold button has been pushed. Every country has been affected. Everybody knows about it. There isn't anybody on this planet that isn't aware of what's going on and has not been affected. Whether it's employment, travel, logistics, it, it just doesn't matter. We're all affected. The, the world's been put on hold. This change that is happening right now has also put a pause on pollution, on war, right, on, on negativity, on crime, right? Cr criminals are staying at home. Uh, uh, terrorist, terrorists are afraid of coronavirus, too. And so anyway, with earth changes that we have been seeing, on both poles and sea uh, temperature changes in the ocean and and the melting of ice caps and all of these changes that we have been seeing uh, globally. Will this pause uh, with pollution and activity and logistics, uh, w would this cause something to change in the environment long term? Long term. I, you know, I think that the forces that are affecting and influencing the environment are on such a grand scale relative to the human scale that I would I would probably be doubtful that it would in the sense that you know it's just in the same way getting back to some of the, the subjects you and I talk about a lot um, you know if you had a an environmental catastrophe whether it was um, you know, a solar related, whether it was uh, asteroid or comet impacts, whether it was volcanic, um, all of these things, and you had a widespread social collapse, which is certainly now something that that's emerging from the evidence of the of the of the geological and paleontological and archaeological records. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what would happen is that you go a few centuries in the future. And it would be difficult to find any trace of all of our handiwork. You know, there, there have been some interesting studies and documentaries done on what would happen if just some by some magical process humans suddenly just disappeared from the planet. And what would happen to the, you know, this, this infrastructure of civilization that we've created? And what would happen is that it would begin to immediately deteriorate without constant upkeep and maintenance. 
you know, all of our infrastructure, you know, I'm in the building business. I certainly do know how rapidly our buildings can begin to degrade if, if they're not kept up. And, and it's an accelerating process. So it may start slow, but it, it picks up momentum as it goes, you know. So what would happen, for example, is, is the, you know, our big buildings are, have to be grounded, and that prevents, um, you know, fires caused by lightning strikes. Well, the, the, the copper cables that ground our large buildings have a lifespan of a century or two. So once those go out, I'll say, I'll say a couple of centuries to, to, to be liberal with it, once those goes out, those buildings are now going to be susceptible to being struck by lightning, which is going to happen all the time because they're tall buildings. Well, those lightning strikes are going to, are going to cause damage, considerable damage. And what it'll do is it begins to open up the building to um, environmental forces, the wind, the rain, the cold, the, you know, the freeze-thaw cycle. What would happen is after about three to 500 years, the most of our uh, cities would now be rapidly turning back into jungles, <clears throat> just like we're now you know, discovering the lost cities in the Amazon basin that have been hidden from us for um, you know, for centuries, but these these cities are going to be one in two thousand years old, right? If we were looking back, if if, if future archaeologists are looking back from ten thousand years from now, they're not going to find much. What's going to happen is our cities are going to have have degraded into rubble. Soil will have formed on top. Trees, plants, wherever, depending on the latitude and the environment, will have taken over. They will quickly begin to. Um, decompose the the materials, and it would be hard pressed for the archaeologist of ten thousand years from now to even know that you know under this under the forest floor under the jungle floor um, that there are the remains of a city. In fact, it, it was said um, by one of the uh, authors of a of a of a book about. Um, well, I forget the exact name of it, but the the essence of it was a world without humans. What would happen? And he was saying that. In ten thousand years, if you know a visitor from outer space or you know a future archaeologist looking for a remnant of our civilization, a couple of things that would probably be indicators would be the what's left of the Great Pyramids and Mount Rushmore. And there wouldn't be much more than that. But um, so you're you know, said, the thing are is, you that, suggesting- and that's even without catastrophes intervening. That's just the normal pace of things. Throw a couple of big catastrophes in there. And you pretty much completed the job. Are you suggesting that if a civilization 500,000 years ago had a city like New York, mm-hmm. right? We wouldn't mm-hmm. know. We would not know. I'm saying that if 10,000 years ago. There was right, no, a city I, like I understand New York. that. I understand the 10,000 year number. Going back, say, 500,000 years. Uh, there would be absolutely oh. no evidence of anything. We would really have to dig for it. We'd have to dig for it. Even if we dug it up, the geologists would look at it and say, oh, this is breccia, which is basically just broken rock, ah, cemented together with you know some kind of a fluidized silica that came in, and they would be looking at it and, and, and not understand, oh, this is the remnants of, of concrete here. This is, some, this is a conglomeratic rock, they would declare, and that would be the end of the discussion. Now, and you're also suggesting that you and I need to start a copper grounding business because it's a growth industry, <laughs> and <laughs> we need to go across the country and start pitching this idea. Well, there are you know there are people that's what they do. You right. Know, my, you know, my wife has a is a ma- actually she is a master electrician. She has you know an unlimited master's Georgia State master's license, so she's very knowledgeable about how all of this works. But, um, yeah, you know, grounding is, is essential to, to, to any building that has an electrical system. And if you don't ground it, you're going to be in trouble. Because, you know, what a grounding system does is it takes that charge and dissipates it into the earth, rather into the building itself. Now, so, when we uh, come back after the break, yeah. we're going to be discussing entropy on a bunch of different levels and from different angles. For you, when you discuss entropy... Uh, what is what is the Randall Carlson definition? Well, you know, there's the, the definition of physics, but how it impacts me personally is exactly what we just 
been talking about. Because when I, if I build a new structure, a new building, a new house, obviously I'm taking measure, uh, measures to reduce the effects of entropy as much as possible. If I'm doing a retrofit, then what I'm doing is I'm going in and trying to undo the effects of entropy on that structure. Because, I mean, that's what happens when, when a structure begins to degrade. I mean, that is entropy right there. So I, I pretty much deal with that, you know, on an empirical basis every single day in my, my day-to-day job. You know, let's figure out, let's, you know, let's caulk this crack here, because if we don't, entropy is going to get in there and, and, and cause problems. Every, you know, entropy can take many different forms. That's but. right, that's right. And so <clears throat> anything uh, that we have, and it can be anything, uh, it, it starts out simple, it, it begins its life simply, but it will eventually come apart. And you have to prevent that. <clears throat> that's right. What we're trying to do is slow down the inevitable. Have Do, do you think we... Uh, we've got about 60 seconds. Do you think we are at a point now in 2020 that we may be able to realize what is going on and that we can circumvent and somehow get out in front of entropy on a global scale? Uh, well, I, you know, I don't, I wouldn't be too optimistic about that. What I would do is think that we are getting better and better at uh, mitigating the effects of entropy. Now, where that, how far that will go, I don't know. But I do think that we are um, getting ahead of the curve a bit on that um, because, again, like I say, in my business, we're always looking, you know, for a quickly say, like back in the early 70s, we were building geodesic domes, okay? A lot of people built geodesic domes, but the problem was is they leaked really bad. And so... There was a big popular movement to building geodesic domes, but then once people discovered it was hard to keep them weatherproof and and leak-proof, they fell out of favor. Well, in the interim, the last 40 years, all kinds of new technologies have evolved that make dome building, you know, Buckminster Fuller-type domes, much more viable because now we have materials that withstand the effects of entropy a lot more effectively. So we can employ those and, you know, conceivably build domes again that don't leak so readily like they did 40 and 50 years ago. So maybe that's an example. Let's take a- the optimist that I am. Okay. <laughs> Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight is, oh, I just hit the wrong. Our guest tonight is Randall Carlson, the beard of knowledge. We'll be right back after this short break. Tonight we're going to discuss entropy and not only with our future, but in the past and what we have learned and what we can do to move forward. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Hello, my name is Billy Carson, and I'm a best-selling author and the founder of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Together with my team, we have built an all-new conscious streaming TV platform designed with every family member in mind. If you have ever wanted to travel the world and attend lectures and workshops from your favorite speakers but weren't able to, look no further. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv There are dozens of workshops and lectures from speakers you know and love. We have also included amazing categories to assure that your consciousness is entertained and elevating on a daily basis. Amazing interviews, ancient history, ascension knowledge, wisdom teachings, documentaries, conspiracies, mysteries, health and fitness, conscious cooking, meditations, finance, yoga, and so much more. To start your free trial on any mobile device or computer, surf to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's Forbidden Knowledge with the number four, ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Again, visit ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Introducing the new Surfer Music app. 
Listen, fade or not, you know I love my music. This is my go-to for all things notes. The Surfer app is a brand new concept in music listening. Surfer is free, providing unlimited access to thousands of live streaming radio stations. Surfer is an exciting interactive listening experience. Discovery and surprise are built right in. Surfer is your destination to discover and rediscover great live streaming music. It features high quality audio streams, free access to music from thousands of live streaming radio stations, unlimited listening, unlimited skipping. You get a music visualizer and you can also select your favorite channels. Get it at the Apple App Store or Google Play. Just search Surfer Music or click on the Surfer banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER, stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation, and angioprim is the result. A safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now to angioprim.com. That's A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M.com. Or to speak with a trained consultant, give angioprim a call at 954-882-7221. That's 954-882-7221. Hello, I'm Kathleen, and you're listening to my own man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, the Planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> we are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Randall Carlson is here. We're discussing entropy tonight. And this is the deal. It's a, I feel like I'm going to school, and I want you guys to feel the same way. Just listen, take some notes, and enjoy the conversation. And uh, no pressure, Randall, but, you know, everybody uh, uh, really, really holds you up there. And uh, we appreciate you bringing the knowledge every time you're on the show and everything that you do out there. And uh, when we discuss entropy and discuss history with somebody like you, what comes to mind when you want to present an example of uh, entropy from the historical record? Well, then clearly that would be the uh, decline of ecosystems that is a, something that I um, you know look at pretty closely and the effects that that would have on human civilizations human societies <clears throat> that's been kind of the, the the area of my focus for a long time now um, you know ordinarily entropy is considered to be a, a, a rather uh, gradual process a gradual decline into disorder 
But there are times when it seems like the entropic process is accelerated by orders of magnitude. And this is mostly brought about by injections of disorder originating from outside what we yeah, what we would call exogenically or, um, originated in the sense that, for example, an asteroid impact will completely will inject extraordinary amounts of disorder into the balance of nature in literally in a matter of seconds. So there's an example. That's the kind of thing I'm looking at. Uh, a coronal mass ejection on the scale of say, a Carrington event could do the same thing. Um, you know, there's evidence that the sun could it actually might be far less stable than we've imagined. And there could be events uh, that are uh, solar in origin that could also um, degrade organized systems in a very rapid fashion. So I'm of the mind that what we need to do is to basically be prepared for these uh, these interruptions in the normal continuum of change, the things that would accelerate uh, the breakdown, uh, the decline into disorder. And, you know, I don't know if what we're in, going into right now would qualify, really, because, <clears throat> you know, we just, we, you know, actually we're, we're seeing that the social systems are breaking down in a sense. However, you know, once the once the lockdowns are lifted, I think we're going to see a very rapid uh, return. Uh, people are anxious to get back out there and engage in their anti-entropic activities, which is a way which you could think of as work. All work, in effect, is trying to counter the effects of entropy. In the healthcare system, it's trying to uh, counter the effects of entropy in our physiological and biological systems, right? What I do, we're trying to do it in our systems of housing and shelter and architecture and so on. But pretty much most of what people do on some level or another is trying to counter the effects of entropy. But what we really need to be thinking about is, I believe, what occurred to uh, our ancestors throughout these 150 or 200,000 years that we homo sapiens sapiens, modern humans, have been living on this planet. And we have seen multiple injections of intense entropy. Uh, the most recent, of course, is the one that's now getting a lot of uh, overdue attention, uh, long overdue attention, which are the uh, changes that occurred in the so-called Younger Dryas, mm -hmm. that you're, I'm sure, quite familiar with that term. Um, and what happened there was, you know, uh, uh, a huge amount of disorder was injected into the the planetary system, and the result of that was a almost total decapitation of the food chain. As an example, um, you know when we the planet lost um, oh over a hundred species of megafauna worldwide that had taken many many millennia to evolve um, over uh, you know the slow evolutionary processes. We also saw the rapid disappearance of the North American Clovis culture, which showed up quite uh, suddenly uh, around 13,300 years ago, lasted for 400 years, and then just very suddenly disappeared right along with the megafauna. And we see major changes in the order of nature, uh, massive climatic shifts, um, Ge geography um, of, of uh, large areas com being completely wiped out and rearranged over a period of uh, a few centuries, even decades or less. Um, you know, the rapid melting of the ice sheets, where you've got the conversion of ice into water and the release of all of the energy, um, and then massive floods sweeping over the land, destroying everything that was there, um, leaving what had been intact landscapes over thousands of square miles, reducing those landscapes to piles of rubble. So, <clears throat> in effect, what I've been doing is focusing on these, like what I call them, these discontinuities within the continuum of, of normal or natural change, because that's where I find all the action to be. And really what those 
points of discontinuity are, those nonlinearities, if you want to look at them that way, is these, this massive breakdown of order. And, and in the case of the Younger Dryas, it is now becoming more and more uh, probable that that disorder was triggered by the incursion of something from outside uh, the Earth's system. You know, in the, uh, probably the most likely candidate would be the debris from the breakdown, the entropic breakdown of a cometary nucleus and the encounter between Earth and that, uh, that uh, debris byproduct of this disintegration of a cometary nucleus, this, which in effect is, again, entropic because it comes in as a single system from deep space, the Kuiper disk or the Oort cloud. It comes in and once it's subjected to the gravitational and heat, thermal uh, forces of, of the planets, particularly Jupiter and the sun and the thermal forces of the sun, it then begins to undergo a disintegration, a breakdown. And then what that does is it creates more, if you want to think of it in these terms, it creates more disorder within the, uh, within the orderly um, system of the, of the inner solar system, right? So you've got, uh, which is normally you've got, you know, <clears throat> when you look at the planetary system, it's a very orderly thing. It's very predictable. You know, that's part of what this is. Um, when you introduced different degrees of disorder and randomness, randomness, which is part of the entropic process, you lose predictability. Now, normally, we can predict things. We can look out there and, and look, at the, look at the machinery of the cosmos, and it's very predictable. But it is now apparent that there are times when that order breaks down completely, and Earth suffers the consequences, and life on Earth will then suffer the consequences of that breakdown in order. And if there are humans who have built societies or civilizations, they too are going to be subject to this massive injection of disorder into the system. And this is where we get back to the idea of potentially a civilization of some kind that existed on the other side of the Younger Dryas. And, you know, this is something that Graham Hancock has been talking about for decades. And most of his critics do not understand the degree to which disorder was introduced into the terrestrial system between, let's say, 11 and 14,000 years ago. Right. So they do not have this framework for thinking about, well, where, where, where is the evidence for a civilization like that? Because they don't understand, you know, some of the, the, the like the landscapes that I look at, I'll just cite, for example, the the Channel Scablands of eastern Washington, because it's an area I'm so thoroughly familiar with. You can go and you can, be, you can actually be standing there on the ground, literally, on the ground, and then you can go, well, wait a second, this was not the surface of the ground 13 or 14,000 years ago. The surface of the ground was 1,000 feet over our head. Yeah, it was up and there. And you travel, right. yeah, now you travel, uh, say, 50 miles down slope, and there is uh, uh, several thousand square miles of rubble. And that rubble used to be the landscape that was there 13, 14, 15,000 years ago. Now, the extent to which that is uh, a consistent process over the plant, whole planet has not been appreciated by a lot of scientists, even geologists, because I talk to geologists all the time. I just, in fact, got a very interesting email from a geologist today who's been looking at my stuff. <clears throat> and what, I, what is happening is I've noticed in the last 10 or 20 years, it's gone from being, well, you know, this is some fringe stuff. Because I was talking about asteroid impacts destroying, um, you know, actually ending the Ice Age literally 25 years ago. And only in 2007 did mainstream scientists begin to come out with papers suggesting exactly that. So now what is happening is I'm actually getting to engage in dialogues with a variety of scientists that are really doing this work <clears throat> and discovering that it's becoming much more acceptable. That, yeah, we're realizing now that, that there was a lot more going on. Because, you know, up to this point, Jimmy, if you were a professional geologist, let's say, you know, through most of the 20th century, Primarily what you were doing was you either worked, you worked for the energy companies, you did, you did, um, 
you know, basically energy surveying. You were looking for hydrocarbon reservoirs. So you weren't really paying attention to landscapes. You weren't paying attention to geomorphology. All, the stuff that was going on on the surface, the stuff you saw was referred to as overburden. So it was just basically stuff in the way. You know, you weren't really too interested in why it was there, you know, what they were interested in is where's the oil down underneath this this rubble. Yeah, they were prospecting. Or you right? Yeah, they were prospecting for for hydrocarbon reservoirs. Say, and then the other was most geologists worked for the government. Um, so, for example, a geologist might that was his work for the government for the last uh, you know say thirty or forty years ago. They might be doing something like, well, I'm looking for a a, 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 a place where we could store nuclear waste without it getting into groundwater. So, I mean, they're looking at uh, uh, dozens and dozens of different problems and issues, but not really looking at, okay, how did this canyon here that's, that's a mile wide and a thousand feet deep get here? Well, it must have gotten there through gradualistic processes that took, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And then you get some mavericks coming along looking and go, well, wait a second. No, not, if we take a closer look, this has all the earmarks of something that happened very, very suddenly. Well, no, you're a crackpot. Get out of here. So the crackpots were the ones who were actually right. And what we see in the 60s, 70s, and 80s is a shifting over from mainstream you know, academic approaches to an interpretation of Earth history into the recognition that Hmm, yes, these orderly processes that prevail most of the time do get interrupted. And when they do, a whole lot of change might get compressed into a very short period of time, the kind of a, the change that we normally think might take 100,000 or a million years to take place, might take place in a year, you see. So we've come full circle because... The early geologists, if you go back to the 1820s, say to the 1870s, when geology was, before it was an actual academic discipline, many of the founding fathers of the geological sciences were catastrophists um, in, in one variation or another. They looked at landscapes and they thought, hmm, how do we explain this without a catastrophe? And what happened was, once geology became an approved academic discipline, the prevailing doctrine became uniformity, gradualism. And what they did was kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater. They said, well, look, if you start talking about catastrophes, you're, you know, you're going back to Noah's flood. And you're, you're, you know, going back to, you know, biblical literalism. And we've evolved past that now. So don't, don't drag us back into, you know, a simple-minded model of a, of a universal flood or anything like that. Leave, leave that alone. And so by the time we get to the, 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 the beginning of the 20th century, catastrophism has been completely erased from the academic curriculums of geology and earth history. And then we get to the 1920s and 1930s. We have that, the, the uh, maverick geologist, geologist by the name of J. Harlan Bretz, who was the, the man who went out and spent like 20 field seasons out in eastern Washington basically demonstrating unequivocally that, yeah, gigantic, unimaginably huge floods had swept over this land and carved and created this landscape. And he amassed huge amounts of evidence that, that really left no possibility of an alternate all, uh, explanation. And believe me, the, the, the mainstream guys tried they tried their damnedest to come up with an alternate explanation but those alternate explanations essentially just collapsed finally there was uh, i think we're coming back up to the 1950s one of the leaders of the of the gradualist uh school of thought who had who had spent years actually trying to discredit brett's his name was uh, galuli he was a distinguished geologist he actually led a um an attempt uh to discredit uh, Brett's once and for all and, and lay to rest this, this heresy of, of c catastrophic floods. But he never went out in the field. He never went out in the field to actually look at the evidence. Finally, he got dragged kicking and screaming out into the field, and he was with a group of colleagues, including some younger geologists who are a little bit now more open-minded to the idea of catastrophic floods. Right. They spent a week right. traveling around this area at these devastated landscapes, the end of the week, they got to a place called Palouse Falls, 
which I've been to many times. Um, and it's a huge a cataract with a little, basically the Palouse River that flows over it now is, is just minuscule. And there's this massive cataract, circular cataract on the scale of Niagara Falls, but with a little creek pouring over it. And that was kind of the coup de grace for him. He had been looking at this stuff all week. And if you look at just one piece of evidence, that's not going to make the case. But when you look at one kind of evidence, then another kind, you look. You might look at a giant current ripple field where you're looking at, you know, when anybody who's ever walked on a sandbar along a creek or on the beach, you've, you've seen sand ripples, right? And typically, they're going to be a few inches in height. You know, there may be six or eight inches in, in wavelength, you know, separating the crests of each of these ripples. That That's normal. I mean, a typical normal river will you go down to any sand bank or, or, or um, you know, uh, um, any any deposit along the side of the river, and you will see these these ripples. Well, there are places from Montana to eastern Washington where you can see ripple fields, where the ripples are the height of a of a three to five story building. The amplitude, you know, thirty to fifty feet in height. The amplitude is two to three hundred feet, and the ripple train might be five or six or seven miles long. Right, right. And then you 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 do uh, you do a, a, an examination of the internal architecture of these ripples, and they're composed of boulders that are anywhere from millions of boulders from anywhere from one to six or eight feet in diameter. And then you go out and you see these, like I was describing earlier, you can look at these canyons, and a, a, a great example is Grand Coulee in, in Washington State, where you've got, <clears throat> you've got ripples on the floor, You've got masses of, of deposits at the, at the mouth of the thing, and these deposits are piles of boulders that cover several thousand square miles, and those boulders, some of them are the size of houses, right? Now, there's no explanation for that in uniformitarian models. And, and these kinds of things could go on and on and on. You know, when you have a giant flood, let's say that it's rushing down through a main trunk valley, and there are tributary valleys coming in, right, from the sides. So normally you've got smaller rivers flowing in smaller valleys. They flow into a bigger river that's in a bigger valley. Now let's say that bigger valley is serving as, as a, a, a conduit for this massive flood. Let's say 100 million, 200 million cubic feet per second is rushing down this valley. Well, what happens is these little tributary rivers or streams coming in from the sideline valleys, they get reversed because the water in the main valley rushes upstream of these tributaries. Now, this water that's carrying down, like all floodwaters, it's choked with sediment. So <clears throat> when the water rushes up the tributary valleys and moving uphill, it's slowing down. Once it gets to the to the highest elevation that it's going to that it's going to go, which is generally about the same elevation that the water level is in the main valley, which might be 500, 600, 7, 800 feet deeper right. than normal floods. Now it begins to flow back out, and when it does that, it leaves a deposit, a thick deposit of mud, right? And in that mud, you can you can go and you can look in there. And what you'll find is you'll find the remains, for example, of forests, what had once been forests, entombed in this mud. You will find the remains of, of, of megafauna. You might dig up, and here's the disarticulated bones of a woolly mammoth or a saber-toothed cat or a giant ground sloth. That, and, 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 and then you can pull out radiocarbon dating, and you can date that because of or there's organic material in there, right? Well, it goes on like this. You can go, and there might be two dozen distinct different types of evidence that you can now integrate. And the, the, the final insight from that is that there's really no other conclusion. You, you might be able to take one of those elements by itself and explain it by gradualistic processes. But when you put it all together, Jimmy, no, then there's no way. It, 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 it clearly signals massive catastrophes. So now, here's this group of geologists They're out traveling over southeastern Washington looking at this stuff. Galuli initially goes out there on, uh, uh, you know, a departure on day one. He's, he's this skeptic, right? Typical academic skeptic. Right. The last day, right. after a week, they've been seeing all of this stuff covering 
you know, literally thousands of square miles. They've been traveling over looking at this stuff. Then they last day they get to Palouse Falls, and he goes out there and he says, uh, one of the uh, uh, participants in the group who wrote about this later said that Galuli walked away from the group, and he was standing there at the precipice of this huge cataract <laughs> and looking at the little little trickle, the stream of the Palouse River running over it, seeing the canyon below it, 400, 500 feet deep, right, with sheer sides, giant boulders laying in the bottom of the canyon. He walked back to the group, and he looked at me and he said, exact words, how could I have been so wrong? Exactly. Exactly. And and I wanted yeah. to ask you, before we head to the break, uh, when we picture in our own mind's eye uh, a mile or two of ice uh, over North America, certainly Canada, but, you know, halfway across the United States, you know, heading south, and you think yeah. about that much ice, right, a mile of ice uh, covering Manhattan, for instance, and then one day it decides to melt, and uh, whatever mm-hmm. caused it, right? Whatever caused it, probably uh, something solar, something cosmic. But uh, when it decides to melt, we are talking about uh, water moving at uh, a thousand miles an hour, right, or faster. And if anything is because before that, it's it's not entropy; everything is stable. Right, the ice is stable. The temperatures are stable, yeah. but then it goes yeah. it goes completely wrong in the other direction. Is that a classic example of uh, entropy from an external force? Oh, I think it would be a really good example on a large scale. Yes, I I, I certainly do. Um, yeah, ice melting is exactly uh, is often invoked as a uh, as an example of entropy. Um, you know, they'll say, well, I wonder some examples of entropy in your kitchen. Well, uh, you know, sugar dissolving in your hot coffee. Right. 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 But yeah, certainly ice melting. But, and, and now we're talking about ice melting on an inconceivable scale. And, and, and I do want to throw out, I don't think that there's, we don't know of anything moving a thousand miles an hour, perhaps a hundred miles an hour, but you got to realize that the, that the force of, uh, the hydraulic forces, increase exponentially with velocity so typically you might go into a let's say you're going to you know people oftentimes in floods they'll get out and they'll try to drive across a um a a flow a a water a flow that might be two or three feet deep right but that water is moving even at just 20 or 25 miles an hour and suddenly all, all of a sudden their vehicle is getting washed away right water movement is incredibly powerful Right, so if you have water that's moving at 50 or 60 or 70 miles an hour, which is basically unheard of today, you can't find, even in a flash flood, you're not going to have water moving that fast. You know, I mean, so fast that, you know, you, you, you know you'd have to have a, a very fast vehicle to outrun it, right? We're ta- that's the kind of velocities we're talking about here. Um, you know, so... You know, the, the the water that created Grand Coulee has been estimated to be 60 to 70 miles an hour. Let's but take that's, uh, well, that's need, way faster than anything that's flowing on Earth today. We need to take a break right here, Randall. Let's get this in. Fade to Black, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Randall Carlson. Tonight, we're discussing entropy. Deborah just said Jimmy's favorite new word is entropy. It's been my favorite new word. For about 20 years, 25, and I'm wearing it out. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black, KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. 
Introducing the new Surfer Music app. Listen, fade or not, you know I love my music. This is my go-to for all things notes. The Surfer app is a brand new concept in music listening. Surfer is free, providing unlimited access to thousands of live streaming radio stations. Surfer is an exciting interactive listening experience. Discovery and surprise are built right in. Surfer is your destination to discover and rediscover great live streaming music. It features high quality audio streams, free access to music from thousands of live streaming radio stations, unlimited listening, unlimited skipping. You get a music visualizer and you can also select your favorite channels. Get it at the Apple App Store or Google Play. Just search Surfer Music or click on the Surfer banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com If you have hard water, the lime scale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate lime scale and other water issues like brown staining and bad odors with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable water systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Rhys Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. back fade to black i am your host jimmy church our guest tonight randall carlson if you ever miss a live show like tonight we're live everywhere but if you ever miss a live show can't be here just get our podcast it's two dollars per month we have over 1200 episodes right there click on the podcast banner at jimmy church radio and like this conversation with randall carlson you can catch it on your way to work the next morning randall okay when we look at uh, the different empires and and societies that expanded in the past, and of course I can reference Egypt or, or Greece and Alexander the Great or Rome, building roads across Europe and expansion and expansion. You know, Rome started off as a, a, a village of huts at one point, expanded uh, rapidly, uh, to the point where it got too complicated and everything just collapsed. We saw it with Spain, uh, Portugal, okay, even even Great Britain. And today we have built this massive infrastructure on this planet uh, in so many different ways, not only with 
with roads and bridges, but uh, uh, technically and communication and computer networks. Have we did we build too fast, too quickly, and are we looking at entropy right now? Where and and we should have learned from the past. Oh, I definitely think we need to learn from the past. Now, I think that <clears throat> what we're doing is we're learning uh, ever more efficient ways to counter the effects of entropy. <clears throat> I think that's part of how one way we might really measure our progress. But what I was getting at earlier is what we have to be cognizant of is these uh, episodes where the amount of energy injected into the system might be orders of magnitude beyond what uh, normally uh, would take place um, in in what we think of as 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 normal, um, you know, as as normal times such as we are in now. Um, because the more energy you put into a system, it it, for example, on a on a molecular level, it excites the molecules. And it also excites and increases the amount of random activity. Um, so essentially, for example, if you just increase the temperature of a system, you've increased the amount of entropy. So basically what happens is under normal circumstances, you've got a very predictable uh, in injection of energy into the global uh, system, right, into the atmospheric system, the, the, the hydrosphere, um, the biosphere. And because of that, it's relatively predictable within within certain parameters. Obviously, there's going to be, um, you know, there's going to be volcanic eruptions that can uh, increase the amount of, of entropy. You know, there's going to be, as we now know, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, even uh, solar-type events, such as the Carrington event, that could... Uh, induce uh, a great deal of, of energy into the system. So, uh, you know, the thing is, is that these are all generally predictable. I think what happens, though, is that there are these m more, uh, I would say, unpredictable events where the amount of energy injected into the system will be orders of magnitude above what we consider normal and predictable. And it's th these times that essentially during these times that any civilization would be vulnerable. And, yeah, we, we can go back to, like, what, 1200 B.C., the, the, the Bronze Age collapse. You know, what happened there? You know, here you, you're talking about um, the collapse of, of civilizations. Well, there you had, what, you had Asia Minor, you had the Aegean region, you had the Caucasus, the Balkans. Um, where else? Yeah, you know, the whole Eastern Mediterranean. You the Eastern the Mediterranean, Inter right, right. The Persian side of things too, as well, and and going north. Yeah. Uh, Turkey, uh, modern day Turkey, which back then was the ancient Armenian highlands. Huge technical leaps were happening at that time. Yes, and then that got interrupted, and there was a dark age that lasted three or four centuries, really, for about three centuries, from right, right. from about twelve hundred. Yeah, and so then, you know, basically what we're seeing is about the time of, um, you know, the civilizations in Tyre and, and in the eastern Mediterranean around 900 B.C., which would be have been the time of, say, biblical time would have been, you know, King Solomon and the building of Solomon's temple is about the, would have been coming at the end of this three centuries of, of Dark Age. So this, of course... Was was catastrophic over over the region of the Mediterranean and contiguous lands, but in the uh, long term uh, scale of of Earth history, it was relatively minor, um, and we're still trying to really work out what was the trigger for that. And uh, but something introduced a great deal of disorder into the system, and as a result, you had a civilizational collapse, and very little record of what happened in the interim two or three centuries yeah so, the, 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 uh, there the, are uh, examples well and and the amnesia that that's the crazy part about this graham hancock talks about it uh so much but the amnesia that yeah. sets in immediately i mean we have to go and dig for it now 
uh, it's it's nearly forgotten about overnight. And you can you can point at any uh, great empire out there when it does come to an end, and it's usually very catastrophic. Uh, the the remnants and and the history is forgotten nearly immediately. The uh, uh, an example, uh, Randall, for me, if you look at Cleopatra, you know, okay, we have you know the Greek period of uh, ancient uh, Egypt certainly, but they had th- three thousand years of history there. And and languages and and writing and hieroglyphics and construction and art and ever the pyramid everything was established. Cleopatra dies, and twenty years later nobody speaks Egyptian and nobody knows how to read hieroglyphics. It was like virtually yeah. overnight, overnight, and it was just forgot. We had to go and figure it out for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in Plato's dialogues, uh, Timaeus and Critias, the ones where he's talking about Atlantis, he actually discusses that. <laughs> and he says that there are regular catastrophes involving uh, mostly uh, floods and fires, great fires. And he talks about that. Um, that and, and he also seems to signal that it's... Uh, celestially based because he uses the period he uses the well he gives he when he at the beginning of Timaeus he invokes the the um the myth of fate which was considered by many including ancient commentators like Proclus and others to indicate a, a very close passage of a comet by the earth and if you read these the account of fate and, um it certainly can be interpreted that way. And Plato opens his dialogue of Atlantis, in, in the story of Atlantis, by um, invoking the myth of Phaeton. But then he, he talks about, um, you know, uh, that there being a regular succession of catastrophes brought about by these various agencies. And, um, and then he points out that as a result of this, um, yeah, here, here's a quote, um, he says, uh, so this is, this is now the, 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 uh, the ancient, the, the very old Egyptian priest who is now relaying this tradition to the, uh, uh, the Athenian lawgiver Solon, whose descendant is now relating this story to Socrates, and Plato is writing it down, right? Right, right. So this old priest says to Solon, he says, to, referring to the, to the Greeks, he says, in mind you are all young, and there is no old opinion handed down among you by ancient tradition, nor any science which is hoary with age. And I will tell you the reason for this. There have been, and will be again, many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water. In other words, great fires and floods. And then he he goes on and he says there is a story which even you have preserved that once upon, uh, once upon a time, Satan, the son of Helios, having yoked the steeds of his father's chariot, but because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father, burned up all that was upon the earth, and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now, Plato says, this has the form of a myth, But it really signifies a declination, which means a declining, a moving downward. It really signifies a declination of the bodies moving around the earth and in the heavens and a great conflagration of all things upon the earth recurring at long intervals of time. And I have before me right here on my desk a number of studies that have come out in the last two or three years overwhelmingly documenting that at the onset of the Younger Dryas, there were, in fact, global firestorms. Now, the, so, and, Plato. Well, and yeah. going back to uh, our point and what we were talking about earlier, we need to know what happened in the past so we can prevent it now. And the yep. the expansion, especially Randall, for me, what we have done since 1995, it has never been like this uh, throughout history. 
the giant leaps that we have made since 1995 willy-nilly, without concern, without any just let's get it done. And it, 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 it is cell phones and laptops and the Internet and flat screen TVs and GPS systems and, and uh, predictabilities and, and probabilities and uh, artificial intelligence and uh, Wall Street being run by a computer system without any consideration on the effects of uh, what this may have on us. And if it unravels, if it unravels, Smart TVs, smart television, smart refrigerators, smart, <laughs> right? Smart toothbrushes. If everything comes unraveled, we're going to go down very, very quickly. And we've built all of this infrastructure and expanded without any consideration at all, looking at the past and the other mistakes that have been made. I, I, I just don't get it. Well, that's why... It's important that we do shows like you're doing, Jimmy, that we have conversations like we're having right now because of the fact that, regrettably, a lot of this kind of stuff has been left up to the Mavericks to sort out because, you know, mainstream scholars and academics, they've got their, they've got their uh, purview of the world, and up until recently, it has not included things like the collapse of civilizations. It has not included looking at ancient records as if there's any credibility to them, like what I just read to you. Right. You know, it's generally all considered to be, if you look at most scholarship, it generally looks at all of this as being purely metaphorical rather than historical, you see. Um, Whereas what I'm trying to do is say, look, we have to take, that's where the geomythology thing comes in. I'm trying to tell people and, and, and get the idea out there that, no, the, we have to look at, the, these are not the, 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 the contrivances of, of illiterate pre-scientific minds who are just inventing stuff out of, of fear and ignorance. Right. No, these are actual records presented symbolically from our ancestors who have gone through these extraordinary experiences. Um, if I may, another little short quote from Plato, which I think is highly relevant here, um, and he's talking about here that this would be in a period, the normal period that we, we were talking about. He says the fact is that wherever the extremity of winter frost or of summer sun does not prevent the human race is always increasing at times and at other times diminishing in numbers. Whatever happened either in your country or in ours or any other region of which we are informed, if any action which is noble or great or in any other way remarkable has taken place, all that has been written down of old and is preserved in our temples, whereas you and other nations just being provided with letters and the other things which in advanced states require, but then at the usual period, now get this, at the usual period, the stream from heaven descends like a pestilence and leaves only those of you who are destitute of letters and education, and thus you have to begin all over again as children and know nothing of what happened in ancient times either among us or among yourselves. That was written 400 B.C., right? Yes. Now, yes. I, it could have been written yesterday. Yes. Yes. Like I said, I've got this study sitting right in front of me on my desk. It's written by a team of, I'm going to guess, we're looking at probably 25 or more scientists, right? Here's, here's the title of this article, which, which was published in the mainstream scientific press in uh, 2018. <clears throat> Here's the title of the article. It's in two parts. Extraordinary. That word. Now, that's not typically the, you know, the dry, non-emotive terms used by scientists, right? Right. Extraordinary biomass burning episode and impact winter triggered by the younger, driest cosmic impact 12,800 years ago. 
And so these two studies by these groups of scientists are finding the imprints of these, this extraordinary biomass burning episode all over the world. So now what we're faced with here is scientific confirmation of what these ancient stories, these ancient myths were telling us all along. The so, uh, yeah, yeah. You, you brought up a, a point earlier that your contribution to circumvent entropy is at a, at a micro level, uh, building and constructing and designing correctly with forethought, right? That's oh, how, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. and and that's your contribution today. What else can we do? I know that there is, I mean, others in society, right? If we all contribute our own little part, then we can start to get out in front of this. Uh, otherwise, it, it's going to come unglued all by itself. And physics says that it will happen. The universe has a way of uh, always moving in this direction. It's just the way that it is, right? Well, how how do businesses um, survive in a in a uh, uh, a challenging economy? They diversify. Life does the same thing. This is how life has increased its probabilities of not. Um, succumbing to the effects of entropy is by diversification. When we look back at these catastrophes, one of the things we learn is that <clears throat> the diversity of life may be reduced. And in most of these uh, uh, catastrophes, it has happened. When we look at the great five mass extinctions in Earth history, that's what characterizes them is the is the drastic uh, reduction in the the, the uh, variety of species. You know, during the, the great dying, it was called the Permian Triassic that occurred around uh, 200 and roughly 252 million years ago. As much as 90% of all species on Earth died off very quickly. You know, the scientists are still arguing what, what triggered it. What seems to have been involved was the conjoined effects of cosmic impact and gigantic volcanism working together amplifying the one amplifying the effects of the other but even there and if we go back you know we come forward to 66 million years ago to the cretaceous tertiary extinction that that wiped out about three quarters of the species including all the dinosaurs right what we do find though is that there were places of refuge there were places where life did survive and from those places of refuge seeds if you want to think of it that way seeds pollen um uh animal life then spread out moved into these vacated uh environments that had been destroyed in the catastrophes and life came back it was the key now and there's an ecological term it's refugia for example if we go back to these younger dryas events of 12 or thirteen thousand years ago when the great megafauna disappeared Right, a lot of those species are gone. You know, there's no woolly mammoths roaming the world today. Right. Right. Now, <clears throat> however, if we look at the distribution of the megafauna now compared to back then, say let's take North America first of all. North America lost about seventy-five percent of its megafaunal species. Now, by megafauna, I mean the great mammalian animals that weigh more than about a hundred pounds in body weight. Right. Both North and South America lost about 75% of their megafaunal species. Eurasia lost about 35%, and Africa only lost about 10%. Now, what that means then is that while the big animals got wiped out a lot of other places, they didn't. Africa, like Central Africa, the highlands of Central Africa, where there are so many great megafaunal species today didn't get impacted as drastically and that is in fact why africa has so many large animal species because they were able 90 percent of the pleistocene megafauna of africa survived so what this is telling us though is that even though there were dramatic effects in africa it wasn't as as dramatically impacted as, say, North America. North America appears to have been basically ground zero. And I think that perhaps in the area of Kenya, the Great Rift Zone, 
is where a lot of these species of animals did survive and were able to, you know, at, at that point branch back out and repopulate northern Africa and, and the, um, you know, central African regions. In other places, those species got completely exterminated. Um, you know, the super bison that existed that was twice the size of the modern bison probably underwent some kind of a genetic change that helped it survive by being reduced in size, which reduced the amount of food that it needed to eat because in the event of an environmental catastrophe, food becomes much more difficult to obtain, particularly for the large herbivores. So if you've got a collapse in the food chain, and in this case we're talking like, say, biomass burning, massive climate change, so we've got degradation of the of the uh, of the um, biosphere in large swaths and the food supply collapses so the herbivores they then succumb to that then the predators that are living on the herbivores they succumb but the point is is that some species do survive and oftentimes we see rapid evolutionary changes in those species bison being a, a, a great example and and we can further um, learn from bisons because we know that that once upon a time there were literally millions of individual bison roaming the great plains of North America when the when the uh, the Europeans arrived, right? And we know that coming close to the uh, end of the 19th century, their numbers had been reduced to a few hundred, right? So so the American North American bison came literally within a hair's breadth of going extinct that's right but what that's then right. what right right but now look you walk in you can walk into the store and you can buy bison burger right there's been a complete rebounding of the species along because of first of all humans were responsible for causing them to almost go extinct but then humans were also responsible for aiding and abetting their recovery right and so if you were to look back thousands of years from now at the fossil record, and you're going to track, you know, the, the, the life cycle of bison, you would probably completely miss the fact that they had come within this hair's breadth of extinction. You could, that could get totally lost in the noise, you see, and you wouldn't even know. So what I'm getting at here is that <clears throat> we now know that many species, th- uh, you know, three-quarters of megafaunal species in North America went extinct. extinct. The other 25%, wouldn't have come through unscathed. Their numbers would have been reduced, but there was enough of them that they were able to repopulate. And, in fact, once a lot of the large predators were gone, it opened up a whole new slew of ecozones that they could then move into and inhabit. But where it gets interesting is because we also see the disappearance of the Clovis culture. This culture that showed up suddenly, left its artifacts all over the landscape of non-glaciated North America, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and then right at the onset of the Younger Dryas, boom, they disappeared. And interesting, their remains are not being found. All, what's being found is their is their artifacts. Yeah, the stuff they left behind. Yeah, it's amazing to me. Uh, we need to take a break right here, but when it comes to the Clovis culture, how little... We actually know. Right here in our own backyard, Randall. It's fascinating to me. Let's uh, continue this conversation right where we're leaving off after this short break. Our guest tonight, Randall Carlson, the Beard of Knowledge. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Mental Guard on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Why is it we're not very good with our health regiment until it's too late? We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, Does anybody call money dough anymore? 
Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So, log on to getthetea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's getthetea.com. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. So are you tired of being tired? Well, then it's time to get the tea. Hey, it's Lisa here to tell you about this all-natural, all-organic tea I've been drinking that has had great results for over 20 years. It's called Life Change Tea, and it's specially formulated to help detoxify and cleanse your kidneys, liver, colon, and blood all at once. The colon is one of the most ignored organs in the human body. The faster that waste is eliminated from the body, the less time that waste sits in our intestines, spreading toxins to our bloodstream. This tea helps cleanse chemicals caused by outside intruders from our entire digestive system. And get this, weight loss can be a side effect. And with continued use of the tea, you can experience clear, healthier, younger looking skin, increased energy, and a happier outlook on life. So if you're tired of being tired, get the life change tea at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. And like me, you'll be glad you did. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Randall Carlson, talking about entropy. Going through it right now. We're staring at it. And what can we do about it? And, and Randall, when we talk about these great catastrophes uh, throughout the past, and I, 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 I do want to go back and, and talk about what happened 60, 65 million years ago. But looking at us today with the ice caps melting and we're watching these giant ice shelves and icebergs just uh, collapse into the oceans and... And we can see the removal of these these glaciers that have been so permanent uh, uh, around the world, literally disappearing overnight. How many degrees of temperature uh, in the shift change is is causing this today? With the shutdown of uh, factories and and transportation and automobiles and 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 boats and things that that have caused some of this temperature change. Is it enough for our scientists to go and look at the data and say, hey, wait a minute here. If we cut back somewhat, we can reverse this and and kick it back a few degrees. Or is it too much for us to to handle? Do, do you have any idea what, what kind of temperature change we're talking about? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've since the end of the Little Ice Age, we've seen a temperature increase of about a degree to a degree and a half. But the glaciers that are that that presently occupy mountain valleys, right, are not as permanent as people believe they are. Um, I have dozens of studies here in my archives uh, looking at, at 
the expansion and contraction of glaciers throughout the Holocene, which is the last 11,600 years. Right. It's quite extraordinary how dynamic they have been. Um, you know, there have been uh, major recessions of glaciers before this. Um, that weren't, example, that weren't there are, wait, wait uh, hold on for a second. That weren't man-made. man-made. That, that weren't caused. No, that were not, no, we're not man-made. Absolutely right. not man-made. Okay. Or man-caused, yeah. Man-caused. Um, <laughs> man-caused, human-caused. Right, man exactly. Caused. Um, most likely due to solar effects. I think that's going to emerge to be a... I think the sun is going to emerge to be a much bigger player in uh, global temperature change on Earth than it has been given credit for. Um, again, there are many, there are dozens and dozens of studies looking at the effects of the sun and how uh, positive feedback effects might amplify small changes in solar radiative output um, and that could cause significant climate, climatological changes on Earth. And we do know that throughout the Holocene, there have been major glacial fluctuations before. If you, a lot of the glaciers, for example, now that are receding in the, in the Alps, I'll just cite that as an example, as they're melting back, what's happening? What's, what they're, you know, as they're melting back, they're, re, they're revealing ground, landscapes that had, had for the last oh, 500 years or so, had been, had been uh, under the glaciers, under the ice, right? Now, they're receding back, and what do you think the... Uh, you know, the glaciologists and geologists are finding, they're finding the remnants of forests that had been growing there not so long ago, going back to the medieval warm period, which was roughly from about 1,900 to 1,000 A.D. up to about between 13 and 1,400 A.D., when the climate cooled by about 2 degrees. And this brought on the Little Ice Age that prevailed um, up until about the mid-1800s. And then it began to ameliorate. And during the last phase of the Little Ice Age, there were uh, periods of, of protracted solar inactivity. Um, the Maunder Minimum, the Dalter Minimum, the Sporer Minimum, all of these were periods that um, where the sun was seen and actually observed to be inactive. The number of sunspots declined to almost nothing. And global temperatures dropped during these periods of solar inactivity. And then in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the sun became active again, and guess what? The planet started warming. Now, I'm not saying that that's the total uh, factor, but it, I think, is, is an important factor that has been downplayed in terms of its importance in causing the 20th century warming. And by the way, we, the planet has not really statistically warmed in the last almost in more than 15, almost 20 years. Um, a lot of the glacier recession that's going on right now is going to be residual because there's always a lag effect. You know, uh, if you uh, change the temperature, for example, set an ice cube tray out on the, on, the, on the table, right? Well, there's a lag. It doesn't instantly melt, does it? Unless you, you know, subjected it to uh, an enormous amount of heat, it's not going to instantly melt but it's going to melt over a period of time, over several hours, right? And so we've got basically, I think we're seeing a, a lag time. And, and it's interesting when, you, when we're talking about ancient civilizations, and this is something I've written about extensively, um, is that we see civilizations prospering during periods of global warmth and declining during periods of global cooling. Because it, it, it follows, and, it, and it's really pretty logical. When you, we can go back to the year 536 A.D., which is considered to have been the coldest year of the last 2,000 years, right? And this was, uh, if you want to like, try to single out uh, uh, one year that could mark the inception of the so-called Dark Ages, that would be the year, right? And what happened is 536 was an extremely cold year, and for the next decade... You had some of the coldest years uh, of, the, of the last 2,000 years, and the planet actually went dark. I mean, in the sense that if we look back in some of the, the archives, the, the, the writings and the journals of the monks and so forth, they will talk about, you know, the sun just being a dim, dim in the sky or weeks at a time where they're not seeing any sun, everything is overcast, there's a lot of dust in the atmosphere, and 
it now does appear that we've got this bi bimodal effect going on. There's evidence that there were several huge volcanic eruptions and possibly even a couple of impacts of small asteroids, right? One in the northern hemisphere off the coast of Norway, another one in the southern hemisphere, right? Now, this dark age period lasted for between three and 400 years, right? It, it spelled the final doom of the Roman Empire. It did. And, yes, and because of this cold weather, you had a succession of agricultural collapses. So food became in very short supply. People began to starve. Because of the malnutrition, their immune systems got weak, right? So this, this cold came on suddenly in 536 A.D. Six years later, in, in, in 542 A.D., you had the onset of the Justinian plague that wiped out at least a third the population of Europe. Now, that, cold, that period of cold and dark, like I said, lasted for three to 400 years. Then between 900 and 1,000 A.D., the planet began to warm. A lot of the studies will suggest and, and support the idea that this 300-year period of global warmth was actually warmer than today. It's called the medieval warm period. Because of the warming period, uh, the growing season extended by roughly a month. And you had prolific crops because, because of the warming, oceans began to outgas CO2. Well, the, the, the type of uh, uh, plants that, are, that uh, rely very much on CO2 for photosynthesis include the C4 plants, which are most food crops. So with this influx of CO2 into the atmosphere, it helped trigger a regeneration of agriculture. So you had a, now, instead of a series of agricultural collapses, you had agricultural abundance. So over, a, and it was during this period of time that, that Greenland, because the ice had retracted in, the green, in Greenland and the planet had warmed, now you had the, the Scandinavians going and farming on the west coast of Greenland, where, you know, come when the Little Ice Age came on, that returned to permafrost, right? So during this period of abundance and warmth, you had increase in human population, increase in human lifespan, decrease in infant mortality, and because of the surpluses, you now were able to have a, a, a growth in human population, and guess what? By the mid-1100s, you now had enough people that could be organized into this, this grand and magnificent cathedral building era that lasted from, uh, for 150 years from about 1150 to the early 1300s. Then look what happened. Early 1300s, between about 1315 and 1340, the onset of the Little Ice Age, which appears to have coincided with a period of solar inactivity, and you had now the medieval warm period came to an end, you had cold come back, you had a succession of agricultural failures, you had... Um, starvation, right? And then what happened? People got weak, and come to 1340s, you had the bubonic plague. Wiped out a third of the population of Europe. That was the end of the cathedral building era. And now for the next 500 years, we were in and out of the Little Ice Age until about 1850 or so. And we have been coming out of the Little Ice Age basically for the last 150 years. The, the glaciers that we're seeing contracting within the last 50 years, really started contracting 150 to 170 years ago. A hundred years before we were pumping CO2 into the atmosphere in any significant amounts. Right. So what is happening is we, there's this tendency now, mostly driven by politics, to ignore the natural forces, which brings us back to an idea I was hitting upon before the break, this idea of diversification. And this is one reason why I'm such an advocate for um, a vigorous space program and establishing beachheads of, of human activity in space. Because if in the case of a global catastrophe, which is far more possible than most people even think at this point, that would be one way of preserving diversity. I mean, I would like to see bases on the moon, right? I would like to see us, us become a space-faring civilization that can explore the entire solar system, that can 
actually harvest the asteroids, the dangerous Earth-crossing asteroids that could trigger global collapse, global catastrophe, which are the most likely candidate, actually, for what would trigger a global catastrophe is an asteroid impact. Asteroids are going to be about 10 times more likely to impact, say, than a comet, unless the comet disintegrated and and littered the inner solar system with the debris of its uh, of its disintegration. And much of that debris would actually be indistinguishable from asteroids. Um, but, you see, we are now in a position. I look back when I was a kid, let's say um, in, in grade school, when, uh, you know, we first started venturing into space. Because when I was born in 1951, we had no presence in space at all, right? By the time I got to adolescence, we were making the first forays into space. Okay, 1961, John F. Kennedy comes along and says, we're going to get to the moon by the end of the, by the, end of the decade. Right now, I know a lot of people think that, 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 you know, oh, it's all a big hoax. I've looked into that. We could talk about that in a future show. I don't believe it's a hoax um, for, a, for many reasons. But, but in any case, what happened? We are now, we have a very significant presence in space. However, that's vulnerable. Because of what I mentioned earlier, this Carrington level event, if that was to occur again, like what happened in 1859, and was actually even a little more powerful, it could per- knock out our electrical systems on a, on a global scale. This would be a, a, a real challenge for us if that happened again. So we need to be developing technologies that can, can actually resist uh, geomagnetic storms and solar storms. This is all within our technological capabilities. We are also now in a position where we are about uh, a decade away. If we had the will, if we had the will, we could be literally within a decade or two harvesting asteroids. And interestingly and ironically, the asteroids that would be the easiest to harvest are the ones that are the most dangerous because they're the ones that are Earth crossers and come the closest to Earth. We could perhaps do the entire process robotically without even sending people. I don't know if that would be the, you know, whether which kind of systems actually evolved if, if we set our minds to it. Um, I don't know at this point. That, that's wide open. But we could be doing it. That's the point. If we don't do this, because this is the, one of the points I've been hammering on literally for 20 years now, we are sitting ducks in a cosmic shooting gallery. No doubt. And we could talk extensively about the number of near misses we've experienced in the last decade or two is ramping up into the hundreds, right? At the same time, astronomers are discovering that the near-Earth space is much more densely populated than anybody had imagined. Right? Geologists are discovering that the entire planetary surface is pockmarked with the scars of these cosmic events. And so between the two, and then we've got the record of of the legacy of of mythology and the stories of old that are confirming and telling us the same stuff. We've got the archaeological records that are showing us that, yes, civilizations have collapsed suddenly. We've got the paleontological records that are telling us that species have suddenly collapsed and disappeared. Right? Why is this happening? So what I'm advocating for, first of all, is we begin to get come together as a planet and realize we're all on the same ship, right? And if, if the event that could cause a, a global catastrophe is, doesn't care about planet, uh, uh, national boundaries, doesn't care about your ethnicity, it doesn't care about what religion you are, right. you know, it, 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 even a small catastrophe. Could, could completely disrupt the supply chain of, our, of food. Once that happens, we're screwed, right? What I've been trying to do is get people to pay attention to the bigger picture. And, and, and that, I think, is going to be the key to our survival, paying attention to the fact that we are part of a bigger ecosystem. And we need to acknowledge that, and we need to respond to that. And I, personally... I'm optimistic, and I have faith in the human species that we can rise to the challenge, that we can do this thing, because I look at all the array of life, and I know from my studies that 99.999% of every species that has ever lived on this planet has gone extinct. Gone extinct not because of some slow, gradual Darwinian process, but have succumbed to these repeated catastrophes. And I think human beings are nature's antidote to that. I think human beings are ultimately the way we vindicate our presence on this planet 
is by protecting this planet, preserving this planet against the kinds of cosmic catastrophes that have occurred over and over and over again. I see humans as life's strategy for the survival and diversification of life. How, if we go back to uh, 530 A.D., and we look at the the few degrees or degree, degree and a half, two degrees, three degrees of temperature swing that happened over a 300, 400 year period. And then to have the warm, what, Antarctica wasn't uh, discovered uh, by the Russians, allegedly, okay, <laughs> until right, right. around 1817. The, uh, the ice shelves must have been dropping off in the oceans uh in in the north and the south poles right if if it was a hotter period after that after that mini ice age but we couldn't see it or witness it going on but it must have had, it That's, must have yeah, occurred right it, yes and we know it has occurred and here's why we know it has occurred because when you have a, a large discharge of ice off of the ice sheets into an ocean those ice sheets have been grinding across the land, right? That ice that dis gets discharged is not pure ice. It's loaded with material that it has, that it has um, shoveled up in, in its uh, movement across the land. That material, that gravelly sand, detritus, all that stuff that's in there, when that ice breaks off into the ocean, it forms huge icebergs. Those icebergs then begin to float out, and as they move into the, into the lower latitudes, they melt. When they melt, the cargo of their continentally derived material falls to the ocean floor, and it forms regular layers. And those are called Dansgaard Oscar layers, and we can now begin to count those and realize, yes, there have been repeated, almost cyclical episodes of massive glacier expansion, followed by contraction, followed by expansion. And during these events, the discharges of ice into the global oceans leave these calling cards in these layers of very coarse material. Because normally, in an ocean, under normal circumstances, you've got all of the little, uh, the plankton and the, the, the benthic or bottom feeders, the, 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 the uh, creatures that live in the water column, they die. They form a, a, a nice, very fine-grained sediment on the ocean floor. Right? right That's right, normal. Right. Then we see that those episodes of normal sedimentation are interrupted, and there are these layers of coarse material. They study the coarse material, and they go, okay, this was derived from Canada. This was derived, say, from, from, from the continent. This is granitic material. This is not material that's even native to this area. It's been transported here by icebergs. So we know that. It's not even amb ambiguous. We know that there have been large-scale expansions and contractions of the global ice sheets, and this is part of the norm. And like you just said, though, you know, a few centuries ago, we had no way of observing that. We can now observe that, again, because we have a presence in space. The uh, so. I, I, I just showed my notes. I, I had written some stuff down uh, over the last half hour, and and I showed it up to the camera, and everybody said it was too fast. I just wanted everybody to see that I wrote down one of my future questions for Randall was plankton. Right, <laughs> I was going to go there, and and you just brought it up. We're going to get to plankton after the break. We're going to go to uh, some overtime tonight, Randall. You don't have a choice. We're right in the middle of this. We're in the thick of it. And let's go back. Okay, you brought up these mass extinction events, which we've had four, possibly five, maybe more, uh, where 75% to 90%, 95% of all life on Earth is, is wiped out. Out. But it goes against the grain of Darwinian theory of evolution because the replacement of those species happened rapidly uh, mm -hmm. across the board. Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of species, it seemed like each year, were just generated. And all of those gaps that were left were immediately filled, and it didn't allow for the the millions and millions of years of evolution, tens of millions of years, according to Darwin, didn't take place. 
uh, has has Earth been perfectly designed to just create life at, at a rapid clip? How how do we explain that? Well, this is this is going to be a, a subject for uh, a future discussion because I think it's going to be beyond the scope of of tonight's talk. But the same forces that introduce uh, that, that trigger mass extinctions are also introducing catalytic substances into the biosphere. And I think that's a very, very interesting and important area, uh, topic of research, and the idea that you would have... Um, a cosmic uh, delivery? Cosmic delivery, yes. We're talking exobiology here. Right, right. And we see, for example, accelerated uh, evolution in the aftermath of the 1908 Siberian event as a microcosmic example, I would suggest. Um, the platinum group metals have very interesting properties, and we know that asteroids and meteorites and entities from space are loaded with the platinum group metals. Those metals are known catalysts. What happens when they're introduced into the biosphere, I think, is going to be a very interesting and important area of research in the next decade or two. What we're already learning is very suggestive. And so I, I suspect that we might discover that the same agencies that can trigger uh, a mass extinction event also may be uh, introducing accelerants, catalytic accelerants, into the system. And we so, uh, discovered uh, last year a meteorite. Uh, I spoke about it at length here on this program. You may have read about it. But they discovered a meteorite that was covered and filled with all of the basic sugars and amino acids that make up RNA, right? Yeah. yeah it, it, it's yeah. just like, let, hold on a minute here. Pump the brakes on this truck. What are you suggesting here? RNA is, uh, uh, is part of the universe. It's just floating around. It's so funny how how many people will fight this idea, but yet when it's yeah. discovered, it's one of the most significant statements that any could anybody could make about life on Earth and humanity and life throughout the universe, right? Mm-hmm. I think that what we're discovering is that or the the precursors of organic life are very widespread. What they need, though is a proper environmental matrix to actually begin the process, the evolutionary process. So, you know, we, we inhabit a planet that's very unique in its own way. And if you were to change the parameters of our planetary system, even in the slightest, the possibility of higher life basically disappears. You know, there's a whole array of, of things that have to be precisely balanced in order for for us to, you know, think about if there was no moon. If there was no moon, there would be no tides. If there was no tides, there would be no intertidal zone. If there was no intertidal zone, you could not have transitionary species between a marine uh, existence and a terrestrial existence. That's just one example, right? If the outer planets were, were if their masses and their distances were, uh, adjusted even a small amount, what would happen then is the ability of transferring comets from the deep the zones in deep space like the Kuiper disk mm -hmm. would disappear. Because, as it turns out, the planets happen to be just precisely arranged with the precise distances and precise masses that would be needed in order to create, a, as it's been called, a cosmic bucket brigade that could now begin to deliver comets from the outer zones into the inner solar system, where they could now begin to disintegrate and, and pollinate, if you will, the inner solar system with their exotic uh, materials that they're carrying in their frozen, deep frozen matrix. Yeah, and I find it interesting. We've got to take a break right here. But I find it interesting how we thought that our solar system wa was unique with its moons and uh, the amount of planets, where now we're discovering solar systems are just part of the evolution of the universe. It is the construction. You have a star, you have the dust that is around it, and the gravity will build those planets at those orbits anyway. 
It's just the way that it is. It's perfect. We'll be right back. Our guest tonight, Randall Carlson. I've got the question of the night staged. What is it? You're going to find out when we come back. Stay with us. Fade to black, Randall Carlson. More after the short break. Stay with us. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of Fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hello, my name is Billy Carson, and I'm a best-selling author and the founder of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Together with my team, we have built an all-new conscious streaming TV platform designed with every family member in mind. If you have ever wanted to travel the world and attend lectures and workshops from your favorite speakers but weren't able to, look no further. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv There are dozens of workshops and lectures from speakers you know and love. We have also included amazing categories to assure that your consciousness is entertained and elevating on a daily basis. Amazing interviews, ancient history, ascension knowledge, wisdom teachings, documentaries, conspiracies, mysteries, health and fitness, conscious cooking, meditations, finance, yoga, and so much more. To start your free trial on any mobile device or computer, surf to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's Forbidden Knowledge with the number four, ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Again, visit ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back. It is overtime with Randall Carlson. I want to thank Randall in advance for allowing me to set him up uh, for overtime tonight. Randall, you saw it coming, though, didn't you? You're, you're, <laughs> you're like... Well, I suspected as much, Jimmy. Um... The, uh, I, I don't want to let this go. That we, until very recently, we thought that we were very unique, that the solar system was unique. And we're finding out that it's actually the norm throughout the universe. Multiple planets around uh, their sun is is just a natural thing to have happened since the Big Bang. And we may not be as unique as we, we thought for all of these years. Well, we may not, but on the other hand, we may be, because 
to the extent that I have been able to study, and I guess I need to be about four people so that I can study everything that I would like to study in this lifetime. But what I'm seeing is that there are solar systems with planets, yet the planets, for whatever reason, would not necessarily be suitable habitats for higher life. For example, the one of the more recent ones had uh, a large Jupiter-sized planet that was relatively close to uh, an Earth-Sun distance, one astronomical unit. But clearly a planet of that size, the only thing that might live on it would be, you know, slugs um, with that much gravity. When you begin to look at the Earth system, what you realize is that there's a very, very narrow range of parameters. Um, you know, if you increase the, the mass of the Earth too much, well, then, you know, again, you have... The, the difficulty to get to higher life forms. You might have life. You might have, um, you know, microbial life, no problem. But for the evolution of higher species, you know, if, if you go, if you double or triple the gravity of, of Earth, that becomes very problematic. Likewise, um, if the Earth was, say, a little bit closer to the sun, um, it would probably get too warm. If it was a little bit farther away, it, we'd, we'd go into a... Uh, basically a permanent global ice age. Well, again, you know, just like, you know, there might be life under the ice on Europa, but we're not seeing higher life. We're not, you know, seeing life that can actually come out and, 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 and you know, build a civilization. Um, what I think we're, we're seeing, actually, what I think we're learning from these other worlds that we're discovering is that the likelihood of those worlds being inhabited with civilizations at this point is probably unlikely because, and I mentioned earlier just the very fact of the presence of a moon. <clears throat> you know, I mentioned the, the tides. Well, if you didn't have the, you know, the, the moon acts like a flywheel on the earth. Without the moon, the earth's axial motions would be way more chaotic than they are now. And then, you know, which is, you know, sort of germane to the to the topic of conversation tonight is the the increase in 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 uh, chaos and randomness brought about by entropy. But one of the things that the moon does is actually helps as a an entropy reducer by helping to stabilize the Earth into a relatively constant twenty three and a half degrees tilt. Now, if you didn't have the tilt, can you? Uh, you know, when you start imagining, what does that mean if you didn't have the tilt? Well, the seasons well, no seasons are totally re yeah. There'd be no seasons. We'd have right? one. The, the latitudinal belts would be definitely become too hot to inhabit. The both poles would become permanently ice encrusted, and you would have a mid uh, a, a mid range, uh, uh, sort of maybe around forty to forty five degrees latitudinal belt, where you know life could actually thrive. But the problem is, is that, you know, with the change of the parameters, we'd probably introduce all kinds of other problems. You know, um, ocean circulation, for example, would be completely different. So um, the point is, is that, that the Earth's tilt on its axis plays a very important role in establishing the, 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 the range of environmental possibilities. Interestingly, if you look at that range from the, the higher end to the lower end, what you see is that the higher end, you're getting just to, the, to that stage where it's really just too hot for life to thrive and even humans to thrive. You know, when you start getting up to 120, 130 degrees, which is, which is you know, documented temperatures on Earth, or you get to 100 below degrees, now those that represent the extremes. When we get to those extremes, what we're finding is survival, the, the, the complexities of survival increase by orders of magnitude, right? So we're, right now it's almost as if our planet is tuned to not exceed that range because if it exceeded that range, for example, during the Permian-Triassic, um, in either way, that would be very problematic for life. And so we're basically getting back to this idea of these huge, huge energy incursions into the system that seem to disrupt it and destabilize it, destabilize it for relatively short periods of time. But then the planet 
almost it has this almost like built in factor where it's trying to return to stability and that's what it does you perturb the system it oscillates for a while about this mean value and then it it strives to return to that stability and because it does that we're still here after 500 and some million years we being life right so but what happens is when you have an asteroid impact or i per perhaps believe that, that you know great solar storms these are forces that can perturb the stability of the system and that's when we see that the real problems occur now when we look at other planets i don't know i don't know i'm still waiting to see oh hey look there is a planet that's about the size of the earth it's about the right distance from its star the radiative output uh falling upon uh you know, an atmosphere on the planet is going to be about the same 1,300 and some watts per square meter that we have on Earth. It's got a moon to stabilize erratic uh, motions. We see all of these things that could possibly make it Earth-like. Hmm, there's a good candidate. So far, we haven't seen that, though. What okay. we've seen is well, a I... lot of different kinds of planets in a, 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 a diverse array of solar systems, but we haven't really seen anything where the parameters are so similar to the Earth that it's likely that there would be life there like we know it on Earth. Except for the announcement that I made earlier tonight, which is... Oh, well, gosh, hit here, me up today. Here we go. Astronomers have discovered a potentially habitable Earth-sized exoplanet 300 light years away. Uh, out of the 2,681 exoplanets spotted by NASA's Kepler Space Telescope... Between 2009 and 2018, this one of the, is the most similar in size and potential temperature to our own planet. The planet has been dubbed Kepler 1649c. It's 1.06 times larger than Earth, same size as Earth, receives about 75% the amount of light that Earth gets from our sun, and it suggests that the surface temperature of this exoplanet could be similar to our own earth what researchers don't know at this point is its atmosphere and they are looking at that now there we go now see it's a there numbers game though uh randall it's a numbers game uh, right now we're looking at 20 billion rocky earth like planets in our own milky right. way and uh, now how many of those are in the goldilocks zone how many of those have water uh, carbon-based right. oxygen atmosphere with nitrogen. and we, we don't know these things yet, but it's a yeah. numbers game, and it is certainly suggesting uh, the opposite of what we knew 50, 60, 70, or 100 years ago, which is, uh, is there any more planets out there? You know, that's where we right. were. Today we know it's not that kind of party. Okay, here's the question of the night. Are you ready for the beard of knowledge? Hang on, let me, let me, I'm going to just get adjusted in my chair. Take a deep <laughs> breath. Okay. I'm sitting back. Here we go. I'm it, ready. Plankton. Plankton. Flora or fauna? Plankton, flora, or fauna? I stumped the beard of knowledge. I know, right? That's a tough one. Yeah. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. You may have you may have stumped me. What do I do know? I do know <laughs> that, that plankton is a really w broad diversity of organisms. Right. I do know that. Uh, uh, I do know that they're at the bottom of the food chain, the marine food chain. Um, what else? No, I'm having to dig back into the archives. Okay, is a bacteria flora or fauna? Because bacteria, plankton can actually be bacteria. It can be algae. Now, algae, I'm going to say, is flora. You can't right? Google it. You, you can't Google it. Don't do that to me, Randall. See, this is the thing. Um, when we start to discuss things like uh, bacteria or, uh, and and microbial life, and, and certainly you know going up the food chain a couple of steps into plankton, is when when do you think consciousness comes into play? 
uh, you know, when uh, when when does that transition happen? I, I bring this up all the time, and the reason why I do particles and atoms they fascinate me. The the particles that combine throughout the universe to create. Uh, the basics of life, you know, through not only uh, at the atomic level, the molecular level, uh, up to amino acids and, and the basics of everything. But there is a transition that happens at one point because that asteroid that you're talking about is made up of the same matter that you are, right? And so at what point do particles combine and and become sentient and and conscious. Uh, I know you've thought about it. Yeah, and it's only because I have thought about it, uh, and frustratingly have not really come to any <clears throat> any conclusions about it. Um, I don't know. I guess dolphins are in the ocean, and they have a high degree of consciousness. Um, I mean, all life, I'm assuming, has some degree of consciousness. I mean, certainly my cat does. Uh, you know, uh, plankton. I know pl- right. <laughs> plankton has to have some kind of consciousness, right? Um, right. I know the cockroaches that try to get into my kitchen have consciousness because I walk in there and turn the light on. They're hurrying their ass up to get out of there. So, <laughs> but at what point do you get sentient? What point do you become self-aware? I, you know, I don't know. This was a sort of a metaphysical question that I, you know delved into once upon a time in my life, back when I was studying various religious philosophies and psychoanalytics and yoga and meditation and things, and I never came to any conclusions on that. I'm still as up in the air now as I was back then 40 years ago. So Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, okay, finish your thought. Well, I'm just saying that you know yeah it, but at some point it's i kind of feel like i've come full circle in some ways and that's a question i'd like to come back to because you know i'm looking now at issues you know really what is consciousness does consciousness exist after the body or independent of the body right um what happens when when the body we slough off the body i mean is there something that goes on what is the connection between the traditional concept of soul and consciousness? I don't know the answers to these questions, Jimmy. Um, I've been distracted by trying to figure out how to save civilization for the last <laughs> few decades. And I've kind of gotten away from those deep epistemological questions that used to uh, occupy a lot of my time. And the reason why I think today I'm more focused on it than than I have been in the past, uh, because I discuss it often, but today, uh, certainly over the last, let's say, four years, since 2016, this planet has seen darkness and pressure and fake news and craziness uh, around this planet that uh, has affected our consciousness, our emotions, which affects our health and our well-being. And just when I thought that it couldn't get any crazier, the the entire planet is emotionally wrapped up in, in this darkness. And it affected everybody at the same time. All consciousness is interconnected. And mm-hmm. I, I believe that it is. I, I really do. And today, we have been forced into wondering what is going on on a global scale with with our brothers and sisters on this planet. And I think that consciousness now has never been more important and what is actually going on. And it's a good point for us to just stop and, and take a deep breath and collect where we are and where we need to go and how to move forward, just like you're saying. How do we save this planet, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, in January, February, the Department of Defense was planning huge war games right on the border of Russia. Putin was planning a response. 18,000 troops right. were going to be transported over to participate in all of that. Hey, those war games, those confrontational, tension-building war games got canceled. So there's some upside to this. 
You know, my thing is I've all along been go, come on, all you war makers, let's get together and realize that we can take the machinery of war and we can transform it. We can metamorphosize it into the machinery of expanding into the into the cosmos and we will discover there that the resource base of materials raw materials and energy is so inconceivably vast that we wouldn't we could bypass the need for um conflict over um resource control because that's ultimately what's at the yes religion will drive it but ultimately what is 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 driving conflicts wars is ultimately control of resources and when we look back at the younger dryas in the aftermath of that you know as maria gimbutas has, has documented extensively in some of her work is that for about three or four thousand years there doesn't appear to be any or, or virtually no evidence of human conflict you know um the the, the tools and the uh, that were being built there are there, created appear to be uh not including weapons of war the 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 communities that were being formed ha- uh, didn't have moats or embattlements there were no palisades to suggest that they were uh, uh fighting off an enemy and and really see that makes sense because once you understand that the human population bottlenecked in the younger dryas and that there was a whole basically planet rearranged with new habitats that were largely unoccupied and now nature is making this rapid recovery in the the climatic optimum as it's called that came in the wake of the younger dryas there was no reason for conflict because the human population was small the territories were vast the resource base was massive and so for three or four thousand years you basically had a very pastoral type of existence. Farming. You had the, 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 yeah, the farming, the foundations of agriculture, and you also had hunting and gathering go, existing right along with the farming because after the decapitation of the food chain, you had this huge proliferation of small species, which included a lot of game species, right, because the predators were basically gone, or, or half the predators were gone, right? So the smaller species, they proliferated and, and regenerated wildly. So you had an environment that was very nurturing, in effect. You know, this is, we find a lot of these goddess effigies during this period, during which people are basically worshipping nature, because after the catastrophes of the Younger Dryas, which were probably the result of the the machinations of an angry sky god, now we had this return to a garden-like or Eden-like existence that lasted for about 4,000 years until the onset of the neoglaciation, which was a cooling of the Earth's climate that occurred between five and 6,000 years ago. And then we began to see the evidence for conflict again uh, returning to the you know the here human sphere of activity because for one thing during the three to four thousand years of the climatic optimum you had a huge increase in human population after the bottleneck of the younger dryas and so you had patterns of settled you had territories that had kind of been laid out and were now settled you had community groups that had been occupying these areas for thousands of years but now with the onset of global cooling during the neoglaciation what happened was you had these huge environmental changes. You know, you had farming that was going on at 10,000 feet above sea level. That's suddenly not possible anymore, right? Um, it's, it's, it's very much like what happened to the Scandinavians uh, in Greenland during the medieval warm period. When the Little Ice Age came on, they basically over a period, it, it wasn't all at once, but it took about a century, and they were basically frozen out, and That's they right. became extinct. That's right. Yeah. So, yes. So the point here being, I guess, is that that um, I'm not sure what the point is. The point, the, the other point. than the fact that we need to start paying attention. <laughs> And that and is get the our point. Shit together. That's right. That's right. And the there's uh, uh, for me now. I forgot my point. I had something <laughs> extraordinary that I was going to lay right. out there. 
But uh, listen. I know you did. <laughs> Randall, thank you so much, my friend. And, uh, and it was right there, too. It was right there on the front of my brain. We'll save it, we'll save it for another show. Thank you so much. And let me, let me throw in a quick plug if people want to get more deeply into this. Plug. I'm doing a podcast now with some, some good friends of mine. It's called Cosmographia. K O S M O G R A P H I A dot com and Randallcarlton dot net. They will be able to find a whole lot of uh, podcasts with images and video clips and stuff that gets into all of the stuff you and me have been talking about. And uh, you said it's all over at uh, uh, well, what about Sacred Geometry International dot com? Is it well, there? I haven't been contributing to that for a little while, so okay. there's nothing new there. But okay. You, um, there's still a lot of good stuff there. Okay, give, stuff. give me that link again. Co- the Cosmographia? Yeah, Cosmo, Cosmo, G-R-A-P-H-I-A. H-I-A dot com. Dot com. I got it Cosmo right here. Cosmo is K-O-S-M-O. Oh, it's Cosmo with a K. Okay, I'll get this with up. With a K. I'll get this up right now uh, throughout social media. Randall, thank you so much, my friend. And uh, again, keep doing what you're doing. I look forward to our next conversation on this program. Thank you so much. Well, me too. Thank you, Jimmy, for having me. You're the best, Randall. The Beard of Knowledge. And with that, I'm going to get out of here. I want to remind everybody tomorrow night is uh, Fader Night with open lines all night long. It is Cosmographia, with a K, dot com. I will get that up in Twitter immediately, and uh, I want everybody to go over and check it out. There is nothing more fun than getting your learn on from Randall Carlson. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Fade to Black executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by, and I've lost my show notes in one click, Hill J. Palm, Renee Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Batoa, Mark D. Kobar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast owned and copyrighted 2020 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Thank you to Randall Carlson, Cosmographia.com. I'll get it up right now in social media. Tomorrow night's Fader Night, open lines all night long. Until then, everybody be safe. Go back, Lee Tappies.